are live. So I was going to I was going to do like some whole sound effect stuff of like we want Scott. We want Scott. We want Scott. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Mr. Scott Scams. Thanks for having me, Peter. King of me. the Scott is now. Can you show off some of your VJ skills quickly before we uh, get started on the serious stuff? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. We, fit... we need to do a wipe. <laughs> we need to do a wipe. There we go. Look at that. Now, side it's... wipe. Side wipe. Whoa. <laughs> I think Amazing. that's my favorite one. If, anything, right. if anything good came out of the pandemic, all types of tools for streaming just like popped out of the ether. So we got to try and find the benefit in there somewhere. Right. Yeah. So why don't you tell us, uh, I, I'm going to get out of the way, and uh, mm -hmm. why don't you tell us what we're going to talk about today, and uh, let's get started. So the goal of today is to try and present some of the material that we've presented in years past. So the pre presentation I have for today um, was a workshop that we put on in Grass Valley in the spring of 2017 with Eric Brandstand from Greenhouse Advisory Group. And the, the goal of that workshop was to try and take the really complicated information from Dr. Elaine and distill it down into some, um, you know, easy to understand theory or definitions of theory. And so today's workshop is a reproduction of the webinar, or excuse me, the workshop that I put on in 2017, um, which was a great time for me. You know, I, that was a big time for us in, in our work life. Um, you know, Dr. Lane Ingham was at that workshop with us as well. And so it was like, you know, getting her seal of approval on releasing us into the wild and, you know, allowing us a voice and qualifying that voice really, you know, people came to see Dr. Lane. They didn't have any clue who I was. They didn't know that there was some value that I could have brought to them. And the reality is that by the time we put on that workshop in the spring of 2017. My wife, Sarah, and I had already worked with over a million square feet of cannabis cultivation. We had worked with many thousand acres of um, traditional agriculture, and we had compiled a remarkable amount of data to try and communicate to the public. And so, you know, early on in our, our production career, I guess you could say, you know, I didn't want to record things. I didn't feel like I was able to put something that was quality that I would feel would represent our work well that could be enshrined in the YouTube histories. And so it's taken a little bit of time to produce this material, but I feel like we're now to the point where I can, you know, provide something of quality um, to the people out there. So it did take a little bit longer than we intended to get this type of stuff on to something like YouTube or a widespread market, but um, we're here now, so we might as well continue. So, and your first, oh, you had to do a wipe. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go back. Take, take two. There you go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this presentation is called the science of living soul systems. Um, and what I mean by that is the living soil world really likes to exist in the concepts of intention, which intention is extremely important for outcome. Um, it likes to live in concepts and theories. And all that I'm trying to provide to the market is that there's, there's a tremendous body of actual science of quantification for these matters of living soil. And, and Dr. Lane Ingham has literally done four decades of research on the concept of living soil systems. She has put a microscope to every imaginable situation and context. And then people like my wife, Sarah, and I have continued on that work. Um, there are other graduates of the Soul Food Web that are carrying on that torch as well. And so my goal today is just to try and present a distillation of the, the theory involved with living soil systems. Um, So I um, grew up in Southern California, but I spent half of my life 
in a farm region. And I would spend half my childhood in the farm. Um, shortly after the, um, the farm crisis of the early 80s. And so I grew up watching my uncle who was a produce broker that would work with farmers in the area after the 1980s farm crisis. And so I got a very intimate knowledge of what it was like to be a farmer during a very difficult time. I saw how the, the town changed. I saw how people changed and I saw how that affected my world. And then the other half of my life was spent in suburban Southern California. And so I had this really interesting contrast that, that brought me to a really interesting life. And so I would, as a kid, do everything involved in the agricultural process. So when we were you know, kids, we would go out into the fields and grab watermelons and bring them back for dinner. By the time we could lift 50 to 100 pounds, we were put into the cold room storage and we actually, as kids, had a route taking local produce from the farmers in the Imperial Valley, and we would distribute it to restaurants in the area. Um, we would work in the cold room, running forklifts. We would load trucks. And then when we became 18, we would get to work in the brokerage office. So we would work directly with the farmer. We would um, try to negotiate the best price on behalf of the farmer. And then we would have daily um, conversations with the farmer about the crop. And I think one thing my uncle did really well that made him a good name in the industry was that he would actually go out in the field. And so before he started representing a farmer that was selling lettuce or onions or whatever, he would actually drive to the farm and get in the field and we would dig up some of the produce and we would look at the quality of the produce and based on how that produce looked would determine how far away from its home it could go. And so, you know, we were getting into the field as very young, young adults. Um, after high school and into my 20s, some of my friends from high school would get into um, cannabis during the peak of the Prop 215 era. And, um, you know, at that time, you could get a cultivator's permit for $250 and you could stack licenses and either we could get away with it or we at least thought we could get away with it. And nonetheless, people were doing it. And so I was able to take those conversations with farmers about outcome and about fertilizer strategies and how um, certain obstacles would happen in the cultivation space. And I was able to translate that to cannabis. Um, in 2009, and into 2010, one of my good friends from high school uh, joined up with four other cultivators that were growing in houses and turned that into a 20,000 square foot warehouse. So the very first time I saw cannabis being grown in person was in the build out of a 20,000 square foot facility that had four different cultivators coming together. And all four of those cultivators had different strategies. So one of the guys was doing rock wool on tables there was a guy that was experimenting with undercurrent systems. There was a guy that was doing um, Dutch bucket type flood and drain strategies. And then my buddy Chad was doing, you know, that was when the fabric pots had first came out. So he was doing Fox Farm soil with Floranova and some Hygrozyme. And he kept it really simple. And I got to see the build out of that facility. I got to see what it looked like to scale cannabis. I got to see what the capabilities um, and obstacles of different cultivation strategies did as people were trying to scale. And so I saw complete catastrophic crop loss in the undercurrent system. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, when it went off, it was absolutely remarkable. But that area of the farm produced very little income and it actually was, was a catastrophic loss more than it was of benefit. Um, out of that facility, the best quality did come from the guy that was doing the rock wool on tables, but it was clear that what my buddy Chad was doing with a really simple strategy growing pre-98 Bubba's is what paid the bills. And so early on, I had very little desire to get into the, any of the hydroponic techniques. I was um, interested by them. I was amazed by them. I was obviously surrounded by them in Southern California. 
literally, you know, it was in everybody's home. And, but I saw, you know, it was the consistency of that basic soil with a quasi organic strategy and some enzymes, you know, that really led to long-term sustainability. And so my personal passion and path was in soil-based systems, even though I was surrounded by hydroponics. And then um, somewhere around 2012, 2013 is when I started finding Dr. Lane Ingham. And the catalyst for that was one of my good friends and hydroponic mentors, a guy named Randall Patton, who built a facility called Candescent in Southern California. And I haven't looked up lately, but as of a year or so ago, Candescent had the most flour on the shelf in any of any uh, California brand. And so the people that I was learning from were some of the first to pioneer large commercial scale cannabis farms. And so I got to see very intimately from the inside what Randall was doing with Candescent and what the obstacles in the regulated era were with hydroponic techniques. And that's when I really started to get into the Dr. Lane work because, you know, I had literally been to a tremendous amount of indoor farms in Southern California and was providing assistance of some sort to those friends and networks of family. And I couldn't meet one person that had a legitimate strategy for powdery mildew. I couldn't find anybody that understood why powdery mildew was there. I couldn't find anybody that understood the nutritional parameters for the protection of powdery mildew. And the only thing that I had able, been able to find was some papers from Dr. Elaine Ingham that people might be familiar with. So you've got like the compost tea brewing manual. And I remember some very important conversations with those hydroponic buddies in the garage, if you will. And, you know, anytime I would bring up Dr. Lane, people would lose their damn minds and they would say really ridiculous things like, I don't need a 60 year old white woman to tell me how to grow cannabis. And I just found this like remarkable resistance to any of the contributions of Dr. Lane, which honestly are still kind of there, which is interesting. And what I saw in Dr. Lane was that she provided a roadmap for protection from things like powdery mildew and what the parameters were for powdery mildew. I didn't know how to get there. You know, she would put parameters in the compost tea brewing manual for organism biomass. And um, I didn't know how you were able to get there. But I knew that every time I brought up the concept of compost tea as a protection for powdery mildew, people would get really upset. And then somewhere along my journey, I met a woman named Jody that was a friend of a friend that had a all girl cannabis farm up here in Grass Valley. And coming from Southern California, Jody might as well have been from the moon. And I had, you know, I had only seen male only farms. I had only seen hydroponics. I had only seen a very dominant violent strategy for cultivation of cannabis. And then along came Jody talking about mystic moon cycles and all girls and all types of wild stuff from my current paradigm of that time. And I would ask Jody, you know, where do spider mites come from? And she would just say compost fixes everything. And I'd say, Jody, but where do spider mites come from? And she would just really kind of dismissively say compost fixes everything. And so I left really with no measurable information change, just this phrase, compost fixes everything. And so on one hand, I had Dr. Lane's um, Soul Food Web Manual, and then I just met the first human that ever talked about compost fixing things. And in that same year, I met Tom. Um, Tom and I went to Haiti together. We built um, aquaponic systems in um, Port-au-Prince and I found myself in a earthquake ravaged place with no resources of any type. And we showed up with the most complex chemistry system you could ever imagine in a aquaponic system. And I stood there in Haiti almost feeling kind of silly. It's like these people need food and I brought them a chemistry set. And you know, we did some great work in Haiti and we built an aquaponic system with parts that we found at Home Depot um, that ran for several years. In the aquaponic systems, we built, operated, 
with the help of, um, you know, on farm staff, obviously, after we left. But those systems ran for two years after we left, which is what I learned in Southern California. I learned how to go to Home Depot, buy a series of fixtures and plumbing parts and build a flood and drain table that would run reliably after I left. But I just really found myself face to face with the path of what does the planet need? And I felt in that moment that the planet didn't need any more complicated chemistry sets. The planet needed a reconnection with compost. And so Tom and I came back and we were living in San Diego at the time. And there was a municipal facility that would produce compost. And so after my conversations with Tom about Jody and compost fixed everything, he went and got some compost from the local municipal and he top dressed all of his plants and it literally killed his plants. So I was met with these two realities that were very real. One person believes that compost fixes everything. And one person literally, at my advice, killed all his plants. And so I realized that I needed to find a level of quantification for my words. I learned that if I wanted to be an advisor of agricultural crops, I needed to be accountable. I needed to know how to quantify if this compost was going to fix everything or if it was going to kill somebody's plants. <clears throat> and that really set me on the journey that I'm on today, which led me to Dr. Lane Ingham. And um, in 2013, I believe it was, I started getting around to Dr. Lane's workshops. And at that time, there was no online resources. And so you had to find a workshop, you had to schedule in advance, and you had to go. And, um, you know, during that time, I had, you know, started up a new business that didn't go so well. And so I wasn't really in the best financial place, pretty bad, honestly. And so I had to budget very diligently to get the resources together to even get to a workshop. And so when I finally got the opportunity to see Dr. Lane in person, um, you know, you're like a rabid fan in those moments because you've been thinking about this for literal months waiting for this event. You get to hear her talk and then you kind of swarm her at the lunch break. And that's what I did. And so through 2013 um, and 2014, I went to as many workshops as I could. I went to a couple composting uh, seminars where I met Dr. Elaine and a woman named Lloyd Vasquez. And Lloyd Vasquez is still on the staff at the Soil Food Web, which is amazing to see because without Dr. Elaine and also Lloyd Vasquez, I wouldn't be here because they saw me at those workshops and saw that I had a passion. They saw that I had the aptitude. And so they kind of took me under their wing and led me in a direction that led me to here. And after one of those workshops with Dr. Elaine, after a compost workshop, I believe it was, I pulled her aside and said, there's not much resources of your information on the internet. What can I read and what can I study between now and you know six months from now when you're gonna have the microscope course? And she said, we well, should read Ecological Monograph, 1985. And of course I had, um, you know, took a couple hits off the dube during the break. And I wrote down on my notes, Ecological Monograph, 1986. And when I got home, I started searching through the internet for Ecological Monograph, 1986, and the words Elaine Ingham. And you should take a moment to punch that into Google Scholar and see just the remarkable number of returns. It's literal thousands. And I just found myself really kind of confused and overwhelmed by the level of information, not really understanding what she was even talking about. But it opened me up to the concept that this woman had a tremendous body of work and that it was quoted over and over and over again in other thesis, thesis and research papers. And I spent a good few weeks trying to figure it out, and I just couldn't figure it out. And several months later, I was having a conversation with one of my friends that was entering an upper graduate program for biological sciences. And I said, hey, man, like I'm having a hard time finding this research paper. And I told him ecological monograph. I gave him the information that I had because Dr. Elaine said that, you know, the primary foundation of her work was found with this in, in this paper. And a week or two later, he shot me back like 12 papers. And he says, I think this one is what you're looking for. And it's not called Ecological Monograph. It's found within Ecological Monograph. And the name of 
which is a publication of scientific peer-reviewed journals. And so the actual title of the paper is Interactions of Bacteria, Fungi, and Their Nematode Grazers Effects on Nutrient Cycling and Plant Growth. And essentially what Dr. Elaine and her husband, Russell, I don't, most people don't know that Dr. Elaine's husband is also a nematologist and a research scientist. Uh, so they're quite the duo. And this, pa this paper is tremendously long. I think it's 23 pages. A typical peer-reviewed scientific journal is, you know, usually one, two, or three pages. And this one was like 23. Um, it took me like two and a half weeks to get through this paper to highlight words that I was unfamiliar with, try to research them, try to determine what those words meant, and then go back and read this paper. And I'd say it's probably a good month of like trying to dissect this paper before I really was able to understand what the hell it was talking about. And there's a few graphs within this paper um, that I'm going to share. I'm going to dissect just one in this presentation. Um, if you're into reading complicated scientific, you should look into this paper and just read through it. Um, this paper is where we figured out that bacterial feeding nematodes were the biggest bang for the buck. Um, because she talked about the mobilization and, um, and mineralization of nitrogen and phosphate. So, but what I found when I read this paper was the holy shit, this woman has figured out some stuff and it was way deeper than I had ever imagined. And that started the journey that is my soul food web life. And, you know, I can't thank Dr. Lane enough for what she's contributed to my world and how that has affected the agricultural um, community around the work that my wife and I do. Um, I feel that Dr. Elaine was the teacher that I always needed. Most teachers were frustrated with me because I would ask lots of questions. I was very bouncy in class and was always asking very complicated questions. And Dr. Elaine supported that. And instead of getting frustrated by that or kicking me out of class, she would pause and she would point me in the right direction. And so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude for Dr. Laningham. So the first slide that we're going to break down is a graph that really opened my eyes to the potential of soil food web and living soil systems. And essentially what she was doing is they took soil, they sterilized it in an autoclave and they put it into Petri dishes and then they planted wheat seeds and then they grew those wheat seeds for a hundred days. And um, in those Petri dishes, they set up five different groups. So they had the plant, in sterile soil. They had group PB, which is plant plus bacteria. They had PBF, which is plant, bacteria, and fungi, meaning you have the plant, you have the, the uh, storage of nutrition and the ability to have oxygen in the root zone. Then you had plant uh, bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode, which means you have the plant, you have the potential for nutrients and the conversion of nutrients. And then you have plant, bacteria, fungi, and fungal feeding nematodes, which is the full soil food web. So, or well, pretty much. So you have the potential and storage of nutrients, you have oxygen in the root zone, and then you have the releasing of flowering nitrogen. And this is a recreation of one of those graphs. And so on this side, we've got the above ground biomass in grams. Along the bottom, we have the days of the study, which is 100. And then I've color coded all the different organism assemblages. So this first line is the above ground biomass of the wheat grass or wheat plant um, uh, across a given time. And what they would do is at a given date, they would harvest the um, above ground biomass and then they would weigh it. They would also weigh the roots. They would do all kinds of stuff that's in this paper. And so for this first above ground biomass line is you know, a plant with just sterile soil. This next line is the above ground biomass of plant with just bacteria. And you can see that just by adding bacteria, you have a tremendous increase in overall growth and you have a change in the slope that it gets to a bigger biomass. So at 40 days, there's considerably more, almost double 
the biomass of the um, the plant with the sterile soil, and that continues upward trajectory, getting more and more above ground biomass the further you go. And here we have um, a line overlay of overlay of plant, bacteria, and fungi. And so by adding fungi, by adding oxygen in the root zone, you get yet again, a tremendous growth response that is significantly higher than that of just plant and bacteria. I've added this little dotted line here to kind of give a visual representation of what I saw. And what I saw was the timeline of cannabis, because obviously this was about wheat seeds, not cannabis. So I had to infer what would happen with my desired crop. And the first stage of life that we deal with in cannabis is this like clone transplant to veg, which, you know, depending on what your strategy is and where you're going can determine um, how long it is, but it's essentially about 30 days. And what I saw in this graph was, damn, if I just figure out how to get fungi in the system, I can get a plant that's twice as big by the end of my veg. And by the end of 40 days, you know, we're considerably larger of a plant. And I was just like, where do I get fungi? And then here we have another overlay of plant bacteria and bacterial feeding nematode. Again, you can see the above ground biomass increases. And then we have plant bacteria, fungi, and fungal feeding nematodes, which um, follows pretty similar to the bacterial feeding nematode. And then at this point, I saw this other green line here, which is roughly the life cycle of cannabis is about 80 days from start to finish. And I thought, man, how do we get to here? How do I get these organisms into the system so I can get this above ground biomass increase? And what would happen if we did that? Um, those that are good at discerning graphs will look up here and say, well, they all bunch together at 100, 100 days. And the plant, back, plant plus bacteria isn't that much different than all these other organism assemblages. And when I finally made it through the Soil Food Web courses and got to the point where I could sit down and have a couple porters with Dr. Elaine and really just kind of bro down, I asked her about this. And I said, why did the above ground biomass bunch up just below 400 grams at the end of the 100 days? And she says, don't forget, we were growing a grass in a Petri dish. And so they all became root bound. And so if these were in some normal container, that these lines would continue in the above ground biomass would continue with the trajectory. And what I see when I look at this in regards to cannabis, now that you know my wife and I have done uh, microscope analysis for literally hundreds and hundreds of farms across any, every type of growing landscape possible, is that most people aren't anywhere near this assemblage of organisms. And most people are operating somewhere around this green line. Most people are relying almost entirely on packaged powdered bacterial products, including almost none of the Soil Food Web members. Most of the community is also using compost that doesn't even have these other organisms. So it pretty much is just plant and bacteria. And so you can put fungal foods and you can call your tea fungal dominant. You're still not getting on this line. And what we see in our professional work with cannabis farms when we execute these strategies is this is absolutely what happens. And it's very common in our commercial work to reduce the time it takes to get through wet, vet, uh, excuse me, reduce the time it takes to get through veg by up to a week. And people never believe us when we propose that in the beginning. Uh, a lot of people will have a four five or six week veg and we tell them straight off the bat, as soon as you start adding this compost in there, expect to change your schedule by a week. And they never believe us and the plants always grow into the lights on the first harvest. Um, and the same thing happens with, um, you know, the yield. And how this happens is a concept called ecological succession. And um, ecological succession is the concept that as the above ground biomass changes and becomes more complex, so does the below ground biomass. And here we're looking at an image of bare rock. So this is a primary ecosystem or a major event that was a disturbance. So like a flood, a volcanic eruption, um, but essentially it's a parking lot. And if it is left alone to its own devices, you know, not necessarily on the human time scale, 
but on nature's time scale, it will evolve and progress into more and more complex ecosystems. And so we start out as bare rock or lava rock or raw parent material, parent material. We start to get into primary earlier succession grasses. The plants start to move into shrubs, small trees. We get into the bigger trees and eventually we get into what we call an old growth forest. And this is the concept of ecological succession. And what this graph is representing is different ecological succession. So this black line is the bare rock. We're moving into early grasses and then we're moving on up to um, old growth forests. And this graph or this image represents the below ground biomass that's also taking place. So as the ecosystem is becoming more complex, so is the biological communities under the soil. And so these little dots are meant to represent different populations of bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes and arthropods. So over here in the bare rock, it's almost entirely bacteria. It's often even very difficult in these primary ecosystems to even find a predator of bacteria. It's literally just thousands and thousands and thousands of bacteria. As you start to get into early successional grasses, there needs to be a conversion of those nutrients to provide the above ground biomass increase. And so you start to see a little bit of fungi, which increases oxygen to the root zone. And then you also start to see protozoa, which is a predator of the bacteria, releasing these nutrients into available form for the plants. And as you start to move across, you can see over here in the old growth forest, there's a smaller population of bacteria than there is of fungi. And this is what people refer to as fungal dominance. And a lot of things take place as these ecosystems evolve. And so the form of nutrients uh, made available are different. So way over here in the bacterial dominant, um, it's mostly nitrate, which is formed and a lot of weeds and things can feed on that easily accessible nitrate. As you move into the old growth forest, the form of nitrogen starts to become ammonium, which is what the, fung the fungi, 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 whatever the proper pronunciation is, um, start to produce ammoniacal nitrogen, which is what these trees grow off of. And, you know, this concept, I think, is really missed still in a lot of agricultural circles. And if we look to cannabis specifically, cannabis really thrives in this range. So it, it starts to do really well as you approach equal fungi to equal bacteria does really well as fungi starts to equal or exceed. And then it's often quite difficult in cannabis because we're constantly tearing up and turning over and replanting. So it is hard to get to a true mathematical fungal dominance, but um, it's our hypothesis that cannabis would thrive having up to five times the fungal populations of bacterial populations, which is actually really difficult to get to. So in our professional work, we are just trying to get people up to this point um, most people are operating way over here. And so when you're operating way over here, nutrients aren't being delivered as fast as your cannabis plant is accustomed to. And that is literally the basis of all your problems. And so as we move the below ground biomass toward the ranges that cannabis naturally evolved in or its ancestors naturally evolved in, a lot of really magical things start to take place. And if you have a microscope, you can clearly see these things. Um, it's pretty undeniable if you know what you're looking at. And what this image is, is this is from an early successional. So this would be from over here in this range, right? So we're looking at, if we took a soil sample from this successional range and put it on the microscope, it would probably look like this. And notice that all the pieces are fragmented. They're separated, so they're little individual um, islands. Um, and then you can see these red arrows are pointing to clear rocks, essentially. Those are bits of mineral that have not been um, covered in bacteria yet. So this green arrow is pointing to a piece of mineral that is darker in color. That darker color is coming from the bodies of bacteria on that surface and humic acid is being produced as a result. And so the first step in ecological succession or organism development is bacteria start to habitate 
all the soil surfaces or soil particle surfaces rather. And then they start to produce, um, is it alkaline or acid? The bacteria, acid, acid. The bacteria produce acids. And so those acids start to, I had to check with the wife who's just off screen, but um, the, uh, um, the bacteria produce acids that start to mineralize, which means dissolve and then immobilize, which is actually a positive thing, meaning those nutrients go into their body. So the function of the bacteria is mineralizing those pieces and then immobilizing the nutrients. And so as we move farther along, this one would, you know, come from more like this range. So this is an image that would come from the range that we would want cannabis to look like. And it has a very different look. And you can see that all the little pieces are now clumped together. So the second stage of soil formation or soil structure formation, rather, is when the bacteria start to stick to the individual micro pieces and they form aggregation. So micro aggregation and macro ag aggregation. And um, so as those bacteria produce those little sticky substances, all these little pieces start to stick together. And this is the first stage of soil structure. And so the consequence of all these bits sticking together is that there's space, there's space for oxygen. And so if we remember anything from hydroponics, if you don't have enough oxygenation to the root zone, there's a whole lot of plant health problems. And in hydroponics, if you're running a bucket system, it's really easy to just pick up the, uh, the, the bucket and take a look at the roots and you can see that they're brown. You can see that they don't look healthy and you know that it's an oxygenation issue. The one kind of obstacle in living soil systems is you can't just pull that plant out and look at the roots. You know, if you're in a rock wool cube, you can just look at it. You can't do that in living soil. So we need to use a different tool to try to quantify um, what it is that is determining the oxygen in the root zone. And then, so the green arrow here is being pointed to a beneficial fungi. So it's pointing to one of the characteristics with it, which is septa. So those are the little dividing links in between the cell because a beneficial saprophytic fungi will build its body in little segments like little Lego blocks. And then it has a cytoplasm in there that it fills up and completes an entire cell. And then it will move into the next cell and it'll create a, create a second cell. And that process makes for these really even delineations in the body. It's a little hard to see in this one because when we shake up the soil sample, I mean, you're like making a big car wreck. So a lot of stuff bends and breaks and, and distorts. And so sometimes it can be hard to tell that these things are actually straight or would be straight. But the more time you spend on the microscope, the easier it is to tell. And this blue arrow is pointing to um, an actino bacteria. They used to be known actinomycetes and science has come to a new understanding that they're actually bacteria forming a little link in a chain. You probably can't see that on your phones, maybe on your desktop you can, but there's almost a little linkage going on there. And so those still help to create soil structure in that they're binding these aggregates together or at least joining between them and moving those nutrients from one place to the other. And this is a sample that I pulled out of the forest just here in Northern California. Um, and this is what I would define as fungal dominant. We hear this word fungal dominance. We hear a lot of people chasing fungal dominance. This is what I would say fungal dominance actually looks like. And so you can see that there's a tremendous amount of pore space. Um, the aggregates are so big that they're hard to even tell and they're off the screen. All these little brown pieces are actually um, fungal hyphae. And you can see that the green arrow is pointing to the septa. Uh, there's another septa right here. You can see them clearly right here. And if you were in the microscope, you would be able to roll that focus up and down and, and those things would go in and out of focus and you'd uh, be able to see every little bit of them. It's hard to take a photo of the depth of microscope, but nonetheless, it's very easy to discern that these are beneficial saprophytic fungi based on the characteristics that have been laid forth with the work of Dr. Lane Ingham. And um, one of those characteristics is dark brown or tan, sometimes weird colors like blue or pink. But nonetheless, what's happening here is humic acids are being produced in the 
um, alkaline glues that the fungi are producing to dissolve, right? So mineralize and immobilize. So they're mineralizing, which means dissolving, and immobilize means bring them into their body to be released in for plant growth purposes or whatever functions they're actually doing. And so it's really easy to tell that all of these are extremely beneficial fungi, tremendous amount of space. This is a bit of organic matter, but to me visually, I picture this as like a root hair and there's plenty of room for this root hair to come in here and come into contact with these fungal hyphae. And this is also typically categorized as a fungi. Um, Recently, science has reclassified this organism into the protozoa. So you see this a lot online. People call this fungi. Um, people call this good. But this would come into the categoriz categorization of omycetes. And omycetes go into the not desirable category when we are following Dr. Elaine's strategy for analyzing soil systems. We know that these are different because they have an irregular body width. Um, they're very irregular um, and they kind of wobble to and fro. They get thinner, they get thicker. Uh, notice there's also no septa. Um, so there's no delineating lines as you go down like little railroad tracks. So this animal is even forming his body or her body, whatever it may be, into um, using different functions. And so science has actually reclassified these. We still call them omycetes. Mycete is a fungal term. And they're, they're now a protozoa. So we don't even put these into the fungi category. Um, I have the poster here. It didn't, it didn't translate well to the camera, but I think one of the reasons why, you know, the agricultural community has gotten so off base in chasing these organisms is on, on Dr. Lane's microscope organism ID chart, it has these on there. But what I've found in my work is a lot of people have the poster, but almost nobody has the accompanying book. In the accompanying book, there's little arrows that point to the characteristics. And so if you open up the book, it says this, this is not a desirable characteristic. Um, but people just get the poster and they go, oh, fungi. And so I think that's one way that people have been misguided. Also, too, I think, especially in cannabis, um, there's a tendency to define good as what we see most often. And so if you take a compost that does not have any of these guys in here and you add air quote, fungal foods, you will absolutely grow this guy because nature does not let anything go to waste. And so if there is a food resource, something is going to wake up, function and proliferate because of it. Most often it's this guy. Um, there's a tremendous amount of problems with the T brewer configurations that also lend itself to a tremendous population of these. And pretty much the entirety of the work that my wife and I do is going through a cannabis facility and reduce these populations as much as possible. Uh, we've gotten a tremendous uh, opportunity to track this organism due to regulated cannabis. We've been involved in regulated cannabis since 2016. In 2017, when the state of Nevada opened up, they opened up with tremendously difficult microbial parameters to navigate because uh, Nevada, most specifically Las Vegas is a world destination with literally millions of people that come through and there's food involved. And so when a state starts to aggregate the information to form a regulated cannabis protocol, they have to build those governing bodies. And so they take the people from the food industry. So they take the food and in food inspectors from the Las Vegas, Nevada area, and they put them into cannabis. And so the parameters for microbial considerations in the state of Nevada were very similar to what a buffet has to go through. And so they through 2017, it was extremely difficult for farms to navigate that. And we worked with a good handful of cultivators and businesses in the state of Nevada during this time. Uh, the amount of information that we gained on the pathways and travels and consequences of these organisms was unreal. And in my microscope assessment, the most defined thing that we deal with is the relationship between this organism and this organism. That's above nutrient management. That's above soil chemistry. That's above any parameter that we take. This one is the most defined on outcome and it is predictable within a couple percentage points. So uh, actually the farm I met Peter on 
uh, was a 54,000 square feet nursery that went through a crop loss scenario and um, an insurance claim. And so Sarah and I were working with that farm at the time. And so when they went through the crop loss um, procedures, it was our job to go through that entire acre facility that had, um, I don't even know how many hundreds of pots, a tremendous amount. Each bay had 150 pots in it and there were eight bays. So a lot of pots. But nonetheless, we had to go through and determine <laughs> which, <laughs> which plants, or excuse me, what was different about the plants that were exhibiting visible mold and those that were not exhibiting visible mold. And we would go to plants that were sitting right next to each other, one that had a visible mold. We would take a sample of it from that bay, which was 3,250 square feet. We would go through and sample or take a core from all the plants that were not visi uh, exhibiting visible mold. And we took samples from the plants that were exhibiting mold. And we did that for all of the bays. When we sat down and aggregated all that microscope data, the difference between this organism and this organism was the most clear indicator of powdery mildew outcome of anything I've ever measured. And, you know, I, I just don't really know what more to say about this guy, but the entirety of our work is eliminating this guy. And this is a beneficial nematode. This is a bacterial feeding nematode. And we know it's a bacterial feeding nematode because of its parts. And so this blue arrow is pointing up to the chute. So the mouth parts, it looks like a little um, shop vac tube. Um, and that's for literally just sucking up bacteria. We also know it's a bacterial feeding nematode because it has these bulbs. Uh, one is called the median bulb, median bulb, and one is called the terminal bulb. Um, I would assume that this is the median and this is the terminal, um, but I'm the jive guy. Um, my wife holds on to the strict science information. But nonetheless, we know very clearly this is a bacterial feeding nematode. And um, if you're looking at this under video, I used to have a really good video where this little thing was pumping and you could actually see the bacteria going down the chute, getting chomped up, getting squished up and getting pushed into the abdomen. So everything that we quantify under the microscope, if you have the skills, if you've been taught the different um, characteristics of taxonomy, taxonomy of these organisms, you can very clearly identify what is good, what is bad, and how many are there. This is some work by David Johnson, who has kind of carried the torch of soil food web techniques in the conventional college space. So after Dr. Lane went up against um, some GMO stuff, she's told the story, it's probably easy to find online, but it was over the Klebsiella planticula issue. And I really feel that Dr. Lane needs to get more credit for that situation um, of being a legitimate protector of the entire planet. And most people don't even know what that was about. But nonetheless, that significantly compromised her ability to engage in the um, traditional college atmosphere because all that shit is funded by chemical companies. So Dr. David Johnson has continued on soil food web strategies at New Mexico State University, and I think to a certain extent, Chico State University. But this is a slide from one of his presentations that's comparing, comparing F to B ratio. The F to B ratio means we take the fungal number and we divide it by the bacteria. So if the number is less than zero, that means that bacteria is higher than fungi because we're dividing them. So as we get to a number that's greater than one, that means the fungal population is higher than the bacterial number. And what David Johnson was trying to accomplish is what is the effect on above ground biomass of a given calculated fungi to bacteria ratio in a soil? And so he took some biologically complete compost, he mixed it into um, some soil to affect the fungi to bacteria ratio. And then he grew, I believe these are bell beans. And you can see that at the different fungi to bacteria ratio, there's a considerably different change in outcome. It's pretty remarkable actually. And this is exactly what we see in all of our work, especially cannabis. Cannabis responds really well to actual fungi. And, um, so over here, this would be considered a bacterial dominant soil. So we are almost entirely bacteria. If this number is all the way down to a 0 0.0, we're getting approaching to equal fungi and bacteria here. And now we've got fungi that's exceeding. Uh, when I originally made this presentation in 2017, 
the average fungi to bacteria ratio we saw in our lab was a 0.09 to a 0.12. That was, you know, corner to corner of the United States. Didn't matter where you were at. If you were growing cannabis, if you were doing living soil, you were using the available materials. I don't know why, but damn near every sample came out as a 0.09 or a 0.12. Somehow those numbers pop up a lot. And if you're moving into the soil food web space and you've taken the class, you probably, you, you probably see something similar as well. Um, after the workshops in 2017, that's when our compost was available on a commercial scale. And we would actually bring our compost to the workshops and we would sell it in three cubic foot totes. And people would literally heckle us for the price that we were asking for those three cubic foot totes, not realizing that three cubic foot tote, you know, a black and yellow Home Depot tote, that's enough compost to treat 30,000 square feet of cannabis, or that's really enough to keep a traditional outdoor property into biologically complete ranges. So, um, but nonetheless, people were remarkably resistant to the price that we were asking and people would buy it and then people started using it. And a lot of those people would actually call and apologize for being so harsh after they saw the plant growth response. But from 2017 to 2019, we started to see that effect on the market. And so getting actual biologically complete compost into the supply stream started to affect these numbers. And so after 2017, 2018, that number started to go up and we started to see like 0.12 to 0.25s. Outside of our consulting work, I believe the highest F to B ratio I saw that came from outside of our clients um, was like a 0.23 or like a 0.43. And so we're still nowhere near actual fungal dominance, even though people say it all the time. Um, I think what's happening is in the absence of true sap saprophytic fungi, you get omycetes. And so there's a predominant narrative put out by, um, you know, older influencers in the market that have been around a while, that cannabis prefers a bacterial dominant zone. Well, if you're not able to dis discern the difference between beneficial saprophytic fungi and not so beneficial omycetes or water molds or disease causing organisms, you would naturally revert to the fact that cannabis responds better to bacterial dominant than chasing the fungal dominant. And I would agree with that concept in that disease dominant is going to be less of a result than just bacterial dominant. Um, I haven't seen one situation in my work, working with literally millions of square feet of cannabis, working with literal hundreds of farms on the entire planet now. My wife and I are now consulting internationally. And for the last two years, we've been working around the actual world. I have not seen one situation where cannabis did better in a bacterial dominant versus getting to actual fungal dominance. Um, most cannabis is operating in a disease dominant. So... In, in, in the goal of fungal dominance. And we're just remarkably misguided. One of the things that's really common to farmers of all types is the concept of pH. And so, you know, depending on what you believe ideal pH is, some people argue 6.4, whatever it is, 5.8, 6.2, whatever you want. In the center, there's the goal. And as you move up in numbers, you get more alkaline, and as you move down, you become more acid. And most farmers that have done any sort of nutrient formulation realize that there's a correlation between pH and outcome. And diverting one way or the other from the goal ends up in either better or worse scenarios. In living soil, there's no different. Um, and so there's, instead of a pH scale going up and down, there's an aerobic to anaerobic scale. And so as we move up in dissolved oxygen, we move into the aerobic, uh, aerobic zones. And as we move down in oxygen, we move into the anaerobic zones. And so as we get lower oxygen, we actually get a higher presence of disease. And so one of the things that I learned from taking the foundation courses with Dr. Elaine is that a lot of the fungal pathogens in the root zone that we deal with, they don't exist in all spaces. They actually operate in the facultative anaerobic zone or less. And so things like fusarium and other problems that definitely plague the cannabis space and really all farming spaces is 
if people understood that those organisms only wake up and function below a certain level of dissolved oxygen, then the focus would be moved towards how do I maintain dissolved oxygen so that I can evolve out of this range. And so if we take a soil sample from a native soil and we look at it, something from the outside environment, um, it's very common to see spores of fusarium. It's very common to see spores of undesirable organisms. The thing is, are they awake and are they functioning? And the thing with nature is everything is very specialized. So organisms only function in a given range of um, parameters. So temperature, water content, oxygen, elevation to certain degrees. And they just wait in a cysted uh, dormant state until the conditions change that are ideal for their proliferation and then they get to function. And so that's exactly what happens in this range. And one of those organisms that we can very clearly see even without a microscope are fungus gnats. One of the biggest questions people, or one of the most common questions people ask us is how do I get rid of the gnats? The one thing that I really learned from Dr. Lane that has served me tremendous in my professional career is trying to understand the parameters of really anything. And so if we look at gnats, these fungus gnats have a life cycle. It's very short, like three to five days, something along those lines. And if you investigate further into a fungus gnat, you can see, well, what is their food source? Where are they laying their babies or their larva? And what does that look like? The thing about fungus gnats is their larva or their offspring that are, that are laid or hatched or deposited in the soil, whatever the proper terminology is, those larvae need anaerobic bacteria. And so the gnats only show up once you get into a certain level of decreased oxygen decomposition. Either that's your mulch layer is too thick, which is suffocating the soil surface, that's anaerobic decomposition on the soil surface. If you are over applying nutrients, if you are over applying molasses, thick, um, thick syrupy organic products, and those, um, those nutrients are not immediately absorbed by the plant or soaked into the soil system, they are, they are decomposing anaerobically on the soil surface. That produces an abundance of anaerobic bacteria which produces the food source for the larva of gnats. And nature is perfectly executing what is needed for that parameter, whether you like it or not. And if we can try to change the concept of how we look at things, and instead of looking at gnats as a problem that we need to kill, I use them as an indicator of soil health without using the microscope. So if you see gnats, it's at least too much water and you need to, or it's the mulch layer. One of those two things is the greatest um, indicator of gnats or producer of gnats, I guess you could say. And so usually when people try to start to kill the gnats, that's when things get out of control. And we don't take a strategy to kill gnats at all. We adjust parameters of the cultivation space to reduce the food source of the gnats so that they go away naturally on their own. And I think that's the biggest shift in thinking and paradigm that needs to happen to truly have remarkable success with living soil systems. And, um, you know, if you can wrap your mind around that, then a lot of things can really change beneficially for you. This is a extension of the same graph that incorporates the color coding system that my wife, Sarah, came up with to correlate to the numbers on the um, microscope analysis. And as we get into higher levels of oxygen, we go from green block boxes to blue boxes. As we move down and decrease, uh, decreasing oxygen, we go from orange to red. And from our analysis, as you get higher in oxygen, as you get into more green and blue boxes, you get healthier plants and better outcomes. The more orange and red boxes you have, you have worse pests, lower yields and worse outcomes. And I tried to just kind of throw some of the common things that we see. And so gnats are right here in the center. Just above gnats into the aerobic side is thrips. This is one of the most common pest problems in living soil systems. When we look at the microscope analysis of a soil that has thrips, 
it's most often not really anaerobic, but the nutrient cycling potential and populations are out of whack or too low. So when I see thrips, what I interpret that as is nutrients are not being delivered to your plant quick enough from too low of biological activity. As we start to go into decreased oxygen, the form of nitrogen changes, the oxygen in the root zone changes, and the availability of nutrients changes. As you get more anaerobic, calcium precipitates and falls out of solution. Things like phosphate and nitrogen leave as a gas. That's why you can smell those atrocious smells during anaerobic ferments and things like that. Those are literally the nutrients leaving. And so as you go more anaerobic from the center, I guess you could say, you start to move into spider mites and molds. With spider mites, you can still have good growth rates. You can still have high biological activity. There's just a certain level of anaerobic pressure, which is producing an abundance of nitrate nitrogen. And when that is either too much or comes at the wrong time, you get spider mites. Molds start to happen when it's slightly more anaerobic and you start to get an imbalance between the omycetes and the beneficial fungi. And then root aphids are by far the most anaerobic. Um, if, a, if somebody calls in with root aphids and they send a soil sample, they are very far from the goal, biologically speaking, and are usually extremely anaerobic. The same with russet mites and broad mites. Russet mites and broad mites um, come one of two ways that I've really found, which are both the same net effect on chemistry in the leaves. And so as you get extremely anaerobic, you start to run out of calcium because calcium becomes unavailable in those anaerobic situations, actually dissolves, precipitates, falls out of soil solution. And so russet mite and broad mites are the, the pest manifestation of an extreme calcium deficit with and or in excess of nitrate nitrogen. You can also have russet mites and broad mites from extreme environmental conditions. So a lot of times in greenhouses, it's really common for people to pull the greenhouse cover all the way down um, to keep it hidden and it doesn't let enough airflow come through and it negatively affects transpiration of the plant. So calcium, even if it's in the soil solution, even if it's in the root zone, it's not making it into the above ground biomass because we're having a significant compromise of transpiration. And so, you know, when I made this slide back in 2017, we were starting to get into the 30% total cannabinoids. We've since have farms approach 40 um, and past 40% total cannabinoids, which from 2017, 2018, 2019, when we were telling people this, they would literally interrupt you with your line. Um, but we've been helping farms get to these really high potency numbers, you know, since 2016. And then if you get all blue boxes, I call those fish stories. Those are outcomes that nobody believes. Those are things like doubling the industry average for greenhouse yield. Those are hitting the three to four pounds per thousand watt or more. There's some new lighting that's come out in the last year. It's just absolutely crushing it. Um, but people are legitimately hitting three, four pounds or more. And people just literally think you're an asshole if you say something like that. And this is a, um, this is a really old version of, like I said, some of these slides are still from the original 2017 presentation. But this is supposed to represent our microscope analysis form. And so we've got the organisms in this column. So we've got bacteria, fungi, F to B ratio, amoeba, flagellates, nematodes, actinobacteria. And then down at the bottom, we have the anaerobic indicators. And then here we have the ideal range. So um, Sarah and I have been doing this since 2015. And so we're still operating on, you know, what's being termed the old scale. So if you're a student of the, the uh, Soul Food Web courses, you're learning a little bit different numbers. And the reason why you're learning those different numbers is because the understanding of science has changed and the assumed weight of an organism, I guess you could say, the, the understanding of that mathematical calculation has changed. And so that's leading to a different numerical ideal range. And essentially the variation in these numbers and the newer numbers is something like 42%. So these numbers, should be reduced by 42% um, if you're on the new scale. Sarah and I, you know, started out when Dr. Lane was doing the grassroots movement. And we were able to cross paths with Dr. Lane during 
what I feel is a really special time in Soil Food Web. And it was all about the grassroots. Uh, the nice thing is, and I think in part to the work that my wife and I have done and showing people that you can be a successful Soil Food Web consultant, and this is a viable career option, has, has, has brought about the evolution of Dr. Lane's program into a more university or trade school type program. And I think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, the downsides to that is that the new calculator is proprietary. And, you know, Sarah and I are trying to be for everybody. And if you want to calculate on this scale, that spreadsheet is widely available. It's around, it's easy to access, and it's open source. The newer calculator that takes into consideration the new numbers is not open source. It is proprietary and it is owned wholly by the Soil Food Web organization. And that's fine and I support those decisions, but somebody needs to anchor the original work that Dr. Lane started, which is the grassroots. And so we're not, we're not changing our numbers. Um, to me, I don't see that there's a real need to do that just yet. Um, at, in the event, the newer calculation spreadsheet does become open source, we'll consider moving to those numbers. But for now, we're going to continue with the open source numbers and also, we don't want to go back and change all these numbers. It's extremely important that Sarah and I uphold what was instilled in us by Dr. Elaine Ingham, which is extreme integrity over numbers. And so I don't want to go back and change these numbers, even if it's to a new scale. I, I think that that opens up people to question your integrity. And there's a remarkable lack in integrity in the living soil community. And so we take that so far that we're not even gonna readjust these numbers to the new scale. Uh, so now that that's out of the way, that's what these numbers mean. So on the scale that we work for, we're looking for at least 300 micrograms per gram of bacteria and at least 300 micrograms per gram of fungi. We're looking for at least 50 to 100,000 combined amoeba and flagellates. We're looking for at least 100 nematodes and we're looking for these numbers have changed, we've evolved, but as of 2017, we were looking for less than 20,000 ciliates and this omicete value need to be less than 25%. We've now updated our own personal parameters and we call this 5% now. So to have powdery mildew free cannabis, this omicete value needs to be less than 5% of the fungal number. And so this sample is looking at um, a farm that had three flowering rooms. They were living soil. Uh, third party certified, and we're doing a bunch of four day tea brews in a tea brewer that you could never hit the numbers that Dr. Lane defines as healthy parameters. And so they were doing a lot of these tea brews that were coming at the advice of some industry influencers. And they're certified as clean, but because their russet mite problem is so high, they're using things like Eagle 20 and Avid in a regulated facility, which I think is just absolutely remarkable. Um, and so we sampled the three flowering rooms and when you put the numbers into the spreadsheet, it spits out this biomass number. And then Sarah came up with the idea to color code, which I think is extremely impactful. And I feel has had a tremendous influence on people understanding this data. So if you look at the russet mites, what's common is it's all red and orange boxes. Um, and so when we want to be at least the 300, we're at 87. We want to be at least the 300, we're at 11. Uh, we at least have some protozoa, which is coming from the T. Um, but look at the ciliate number. These ciliate numbers are astronomical. These should be less than 20,000, more like less than 15 or 10,000. And we're, we are at the same numbers of what would be in this healthy yield. And if you look at the omicete value, we have an, we have an anaerobic fungi that has a population that's as high as what we're aiming for on the beneficial fungi. So what you're, what you're looking at is literally the upside down version of what your cannabis plant is looking for. And so the, um, the net effect is that, of that is extreme excesses of nitrate nitrogen, which during flower turns into a sucking pest incidence. You also are having considerable issues with calcium availability. So we have russet mites. At the time when we were doing this one, I think this was sometime in middle 2016, I didn't understand how somebody could brew tea and end up with such low levels of bacteria and fungi. 
but such incredibly high levels of ciliates and omicetes. What I've come to figure out is what's happening is these ciliates and omicetes are being produced in the tea brewer with the excessive food input recipes, long brew times and inappropriate equipment. And then the reduction of beneficial organisms is coming from pest control products. So in this situation to get russet mites, they are brewing teas for multiple days, which is producing a tremendous amount of anaerobic disease pressure. And then, and then they're suppressing the beneficial populations with things like Avid, which is horrendous. And for some reason, the ciliates and the omicetes are less affected by or they're being produced in higher amounts in the tea than are being reflected on the test. This sample is from an employee at the facility that was following the same protocol at their house and they were tired of bringing the russet mites to their house from work. And they reached out and asked, would it be actually possible to change the home grow and have them in a position that could actually keep the russet mites from coming into the home grow? And so what we did was we stopped the tea brewing techniques. We sent this person biologically complete compost and changed a little bit about the technique. And, you know, just by stopping the tea brew, completely eliminated the ciliates and omicetes. We got to extremely desirable levels of nutrient cycling organisms, which means this bacterial potential of nutrients is being converted at a very fast rate. We are above the minimum for fungi, which is 300, which means we have adequate oxygen in the root zone for your cannabis plant. All these things translate to a healthy yield without russet mites. And so this employee was able to go into a major commercial facility that was completely inundated by powdery mildew and russet mites and not bring that shit home to their own garden. And I think that's a pretty remarkable statement because that goes outside of the parameters of what most, most people think is even possible. And... This particular yield, this was done in a little five by five tent with a 600 watt uh, double-ended Gavita. And this biological result led to a gram per watt and yield of a novice grower, which at the time in 2016, 2017, if you're hitting a gram per watt in the commercial space, that was enough to pay the bills. Uh, now with improved lighting and just everything that's changed in the industry, people are definitely exceeding that one gram per watt. But with two basic changes to the way biology was being treated in this cultivation space led to an appropriate commercial yield. And so if you highlight the differences in between these, they're pretty remarkable for anybody to see, even if you don't understand these numbers. If these two columns are the pressure for disease and mold, uh, look at the difference in values between the healthy yield and the russet mites for anaerobic indicators. Look at the difference between the soil structure and oxygen in the root zone and the availability and the potential of nutrients in these two samples. And here are some other samples that we had taken from the same year. Uh, this is the same healthy yield data. This is a really common average sample of what we see in most spider mite situations. This is a sample from a very common mold. And this is russet mite carried over from the other page. And again, you don't need to be a soil science to under understand that there's a tremendous difference in these samples. And so what I see when I see these numbers is again, in the healthy yield, we have adequate potential of nutrients. We have adequate um, oxygen in the root zone. We have a tremendous rate of release of those nutrients through predator prey interactions. Um, we've bumped up the nematode number by putting heterabditis nematodes from a predator insect company. And again, zero ciliates, zero mycetes. When we move to spider mites, we have a desirable bacterial population, which would mean that we have the potential and storage of nutrients in the first stages of soil structure, but we are significantly low on fungi, which is oxygen in the root zone, which is leading to decreased oxygen in the root zone, obviously, right? And so that negatively affects our F to B ratio. So here we are back at that little bell bean photo that looks all sad. Um, we do have a desirable population of amoeba and flagellates. So the release of these bacteria are at least happening at a fast rate. So we can have, still have good growth rates. We can still have good growth potential. We can still have good yield. But again, we have an excess of nitrate nitrogen 
and anaerobic mold pressure coming from the ciliates and omycetes. As we move into the mold category, we have the same thing. We have certainly adequate bacterial populations for the storage of nutrients and the potential. We have the first stages of oxygen in the root zone, but the real issue is the relationship between beneficial saprophytic fungi, which is 165, and those omycete water molds, which is literally double. And so by our old 2017 parameters, we're trying to have this number 25% of this number, you know? So you're looking, this number should be one-tenth of what it is now to not have mold. And then when you move into the russet mites, you just have egregious populations of ciliates and omycetes while having extremely dysfunctionally low basic organisms for healthy soil structure and succession. And then, so how do we get back there? And how do we go from where we are to where the things that I speak about and the potential that's here? Uh, Sarah and I view this as a three-phase process. So we need to remove the barriers to success. Most often the barriers to success are excessive water volume, excessive feed volumes, or really bad habits in regards to biology. So excessive brew times, uh, just tea brewing in general is a disaster from our measurement. Um, you know, Sarah and I have been capable of quantifying brewing tea and qualifying that a given tea brew is to the parameters set forth in Dr. Lane's work and the things like compost tea brewing manual. We've been able to do that since 2015. We've worked with literal hundreds of farms. Not one single farm that we've worked with has brewed compost tea that fits within the organism population parameters that Dr. Elaine Ingham defines in those old compost tea brewing manuals for the protection of leaf surfaces. And so the, the tea brewing processes in, in, in the industry are just really atrocious to be clear. And so that's usually the biggest barrier to success and how, and how you deal with biology in general. And so the second thing you need to do is establish and maintain an aerobic environment. Every time that you do anything that compromises oxygen in the soil surface or the top four inches of the soil, you are reducing aerobic organisms. And, you know, there's a common narrative that these things just develop over time, like they just pop out of the ether. And if you intend well enough, these organism populations will increase. Again, in literally hundreds of farms, I've not seen this be the case one single time, um, mostly because people's IPM protocols are always knocking them back. And so the most common strategies for dealing with pests throughout the week are extremely catastrophic to soil organism communities. So even if biology would develop over time, most often the IPM protocol is what's actually keeping that from happening. And then once you remove the barriers and once you're able to maintain an aerobic environment, now you start moving into the peak efficiency and performance, which, you know, We've, we've worked with the top 1% of cannabis farms on the entire planet, and we are still just barely scratching the surface of what's absolutely potential and possible with living soil techniques. And so we're in a constant state of evolving and figuring out what peak even means. And, um, you know, one of the things that we do that I learned from Dr. Elaine is, you know, Dr. Elaine gets a lot of criticism for things that she says. The one thing that she doesn't get enough credit for is that she is constantly evolving. And so, you know, in the time that Sarah and I have been doing this, there's been some pretty significant evolutions. One of them is how we assess the microscope and how we go through the process. So the actual process of doing the quantitative microscope analysis has changed. And then now the change to the different organism biomass. And, you know, Dr. Elaine works that into her protocol and she's constantly evolving. Unfortunately, she doesn't evolve very much on her concepts of mineral balancing and mineral chemistry. But if you knew the attacks and just pure shit she's dealt with from the chemical and mineral camps, you would understand why she say those types of things. But nonetheless, we are constantly evolving as well. If there's something that we have been doing that we are uh, emotionally attached to that we find out is bad, we stop it immediately, we reevaluate, we readjust it, and we move forward. So even if, you know, even the people that you look to as absolute industry leaders, we're still just barely on the upslope of what is actually possible with living soil systems. 
And by far the biggest issue with people in living soil is the mindset. So most people came from a hydroponic background. Most people are influenced by hydroponic mentalities. And a lot of those hydroponic techniques get brought into living soil and they're absolutely antagonistic. So in the, in the concept of hydroponics, you are talking about very water soluble, very available nutrients. And so it becomes a quantity. So how many PPMs of those nutrients, how often and how many days in a row? So it's a nutrient quantity. And so we have this instilled, ingrained concept of it takes this many nutrients to get this much plant growth response. And so in living soil, it's actually a nutrient availability mindset. And so everything that you do as far as behavior, um, IPM protocol, everything that you're doing in the cultivation space, environment, humidity, uh, sunlight intensity, all of these things affect organism populations and the proliferation of those organisms leads to the availability of nutrients. And so the reason why Dr. Ling can say things like all you need is peat moss and biology is because the just extreme power of the communication between the plant turning photosynthetic sunlight energy into root exudates to feed those organisms that creates an availability. And when you increase the availability of nutrients, really magical things start to happen. And, you know, I think one of the things that Sarah and I did really well when we started our professional career is we only gave advice to farms based on the microscope analysis. We really stuck to a very tight lane. We didn't give people advice on soil chemistry. We didn't give advice on um, nutrient. Literally, all we did was analyze their space. And when we came into a space and analyzed it, and then introduced biologically complete compost across the board, we'd see somewhere between a 30 to 40% increase in all categories of literally the top in the industry. And so simply adding biology and managing it in an appropriate way is a remarkable change in outcome. So you're increasing the availability of the nutrients that are already there. Um, it was very common in the first couple of years that we worked with large commercial farms that right off the bat in the first harvest, we would get somewhere between a 30 and 40% increase in all categories, meaning yield went up, potency went up, uh, plant health went up, and pest, pest and pest and disease pressure went down that 30 to 40%. If we were able to work with a farm for six months to 12 months or more, it is um, very common that we would get another 30 to 40%. If we worked with them longer than a year, we would get another 10 to 15% squeezed out of there. And that was still just scratching the surface. Um, you know, so changing the mindset is the biggest obstacle to having success in living soils. And in order to have success, we need to create an environment when, which microbes can thrive. And the more roots you can increase in the top four inches of soil, the more organisms you're going to have. So it's not unfamiliar that people know this should be a diverse blend of cover plants. We also want a mulch layer that encourages aerobic interfaces. People put a lot of thought into pumice, perlite, lava rock, pop, you know, quantities of those items in a given soil mix. Nobody thinks about what happens above the soil surface. And so how do we maintain an aerobic environment? How do we maintain oxygen? How do we maintain porosity from the soil surface up? And that's that interaction with the mulch layer. And also, you know, you need... If you're, if you're basing your practices off of the work of Dr. Lane, you're going to want to avoid practices that are anaerobic or that promote anaerobic conditions in the soil. Uh, these type of statements really fire people up, especially with the, um, you know, rise in popularity of Korean natural farming. I do believe that the Korean natural farming camp has the right heart. I do think it is important, especially we've learned during this uh, pandemic that there might be supply chain disruptions and there might be an obstacle getting the things that you need. So people definitely need to figure out how to aggregate products and, and pieces of organic material, whatever you want on your farm and turn that into farming practices. So I'm a tremendous advocate of those aspects of creating natural farming, but it's absolutely undeniable the negative effects on plant growth that happens with anaerobic conditions in the soil. And if you've done any level of quantification of soil food web organisms, this is also undeniable to you. 
And so under anaerobic conditions, and these are not my definitions, this is science's definitions, uh, they're actually extremely inefficient. Those organisms under anaerobic conditions are not designed for plant growth. They're designed to digest and decompose organic matter as a process of ecological succession to be able to break something down and allow ecological succession to take off again. And so a lot of those smells that you smell, those are your nutrients actually being lost as a gas because those organisms that do anaerobic decomposition are not quite as efficient as the aerobic organisms that are designed for plant growth. Organic matter decomposition is also only taken halfway through the process. So things are kind of left halfway done. And from every measurement I've taken, the more anaerobic conditions you get, the more pests and disease you get. And also a really weird phenomenon is if the soil gets too anaerobic, you actually start to see the breaking down of aerobic organisms. And um, that's a really interesting phenomenon. And so we have cover plants. And so, you know, we have a very diverse blend and we have a very simple blend. I believe this is actually buckwheat. This is like a 12 seed typical agricultural blend. Back in 2016, 2017, you know, we were advocating tremendous number of plants, you know, 12, 15 species, get a lot of them in there. And I do still advocate that for most systems. The longer that we work in commercial cannabis, the more simple I get. And uh, it's, if you're already managing a commercial farm, it can be an absolute undertaking to then also go mow the lawn. And so the longer we do commercial cannabis, the more specific I get and the less plants I use. Um, and so in this one, you can see the dichondra. Um, there you go. So that's the dichondra right here, this guy. And you can look very closely. The dichondra is unaffected by the pests or at least nowhere near as affected as this. I believe it's a bell bean. Um, the nice thing about the dichondra is it also tolerates the um, high dose nutrients that cannabis farmers like to use, whereas this bell bean or whatever this is that's supposed to be acting as a trap plant is just like a mid-flight refueling station for problems. And so this is something my commercial work has shown me to very strongly disagree with the concept of trap plants. I think this is a really nice concept that comes from the permaculture, but unfortunately a lot of the concepts from permaculture don't translate to reality. And I would say that this is one of them. Um, there's a couple people like Sam from Soilscape has a pretty slick deal for dealing with um, um, trap plants. I don't know if he said it on the show, so I hope I'm not blowing his information, but he's the only person I've seen come up with a really good idea for dealing with trap plants. And what he does is he puts these plants in a pot puts them into the greenhouse, you know, does some little stuff to them to get the bugs and then they either bag it or they torch it. Um, I think that's a much better strategy than trying to plant it or keep it in the greenhouse. Literally every single farm I've been to that's trying to do a trap plant, that shit is forgotten in the corner. It's full of bugs and all the pet, all the plants next to it are also full of bugs. And it just kind of like radiates out from those plants. So that's something I'm not a fan of. Um, even though it's a prominent narrative. Next slide. This is uh, this is a like a side slice of um, uh, King Strafaria. I think this is hands down the number one most missed thing in all of living soil cannabis. Um, we've been promoting the use of King Strafaria since 2016. I've even tried selling it on my website. People just don't get it. I'm, I'm done trying to sell it. At some point, somebody will figure out that this is valuable and people start demanding it and they'll start getting into the system. But as of yet, the demand's not really there. Um, what you're looking at is this is the King Strafaria or garden giant that is forming its mycelium underneath the mulch layer. This is a really exaggerated version, but it makes a great photo. And what it shows you is that this mulch layer is being buffered or separated from the soil surface. And so it's keeping the soil surface aerobic. You can also kind of see that they're penetrating down into the soil. And so these King Strafaria fungi are remarkably suited to digesting carbon in the mulch layer and delivering it into the top four inches of soil where, um, where the main biological activity is happening. I think what's really important about the King Strafaria is 
as you water that soil surface, there's an excess water layer. You might not define it as an excess water layer, but to the microscopic, microscopic communities of the organisms, it is an excess water layer. What the King's Trafaria are really suited to doing is absorbing that moisture so it's never standing around. And so if you take a sample of King's Trafaria and you look at it under the microscope, they do kind of resemble omycetes. They're a little bit wider, but they are clear fungi. And you will see some of those pop up but you'll also see a much lower population of omycetes in the soil. And so what I interpret that as happening is the King's Trafaria are like the, um, they're like the perlite of the mulch layer and they maintain aeration and porosity. Another thing that I find they do is if you top dress amendments onto the soil and you do a little bit heavy handed, the King's Trafaria kind of form a barrier from the soil surface and they keep it from getting suffocated. Uh, I think they also do a really good job like the blue mats, the way I run the blue mat system, I don't try to saturate the entire soil surface. I just run the four lanes typically of blue soak hose and the King's Trafari will help spread that moisture out and it'll do it in a way that doesn't lead to anaerobic conditions and disease pressure. So I don't know, maybe somebody will wanna become a mycologist. I don't also wanna be a mycologist. I got too much other shit to do. Um, but somebody should jump on producing King's Trafari for the cannabis community and the cannabis community should figure out that this is beneficial. And good old tea brewing. This is by far the most controversial topic that I deal with. People literally boo me off the stage for my views on tea brewing, but I cannot underestimate the massive amount of quantification of cultivation spaces my wife and I have done. And so I would define tea brewing as the number one cause for problems in the living soil space. Um, if you look at the, the traditional recipes, um, they vary dramatically from what my wife and I do. So if you look at a predominant recipe that's popular on the internet by other influencers, the total volume of nutrients or food sources is literally 100 times what my wife and I put. And so we're doing what we call 0.01% so what you do is you take the mills in or the, uh, the total volume in mills. So there's three, 3,785 mills per gallon. So you take 3,785 times 0 0.001. That's the volume in mills that you should be adding per gallon to a tea brewing to get to a tea brew to get you into the possibility to produce a finished tea that would fall into the parameters defined by Dr. Elaine's four decades of work as being beneficial and um, actually giving protection. So the big obstacle of tea brewing is people aren't achieving the goals they intend out. We hear a lot of people say fungal dominance and they put a lot of fungal foods and you're, you're, you're actually not from a mathematical standpoint getting fungal dominance. From my viewpoint, it's actually incredibly difficult and not even really a good goal to try and have fungal dominance. You don't need fungal dominance in the tea brew. And what ends up happening if you brew for longer and longer and longer, you just reduce the aerobic organisms and actually increase the anaerobic organisms. So you, be, you become disease dominant, not fungal dominant. And so most people aren't actually achieving the goals that they're after. Again, it's really important to have intention. We're big believers in, in that intention is everything, but just like I can't intend to fly and overcome the laws of gravity. You can't intend fungal dominance and avoid producing disease. And the consequence of tea brews going anaerobic is it produces a tremendous amount of nitrates. People love doing fungal dominant flowering teas and you are legitimately introducing the potential for powdery mildew and creating it and pushing it into your plant. So as plants move into the flowering phase, they prefer less nitrate nitrogen. If you go to the hydro store and look at the back of any nutrient bottles, look at the veg, look at the bloom. Usually the veg is nitrate nitrogen or urea. And then as you move into the flowering nitrogen, the nitrate goes down and the ammoniacal nitrogen goes up. And when you produce an anaerobic tea, all those anaerobic organisms are producing nitrates it is literally the cause for sucking pest outbreaks and powdery mildew. The thing, the thing with tea is what people don't understand is the tea that you put in at week two can be the mold or russet mites in week eight. And people don't correlate those together. 
Uh, the work that we've done tracking farms from start to finish absolutely correlate them. Um, you can go through a facility with a quantitative microscope analysis, and you can even determine which employees are better at cleaning tea brewing equipment. You can be so accurate. And then elevation. Elevation is a remarkable impact on tea brewing. Oftentimes, if you're above two, 3,000 foot elevation, the beneficial organisms, or excuse me, the aerobic organisms won't even wake up and consume the food sources. So from the time you start the tea brew to finish, you didn't even wake up aerobic organisms and you are only proliferating anaerobic organisms. And, you know, I would personally like to see more quantification and accountability in the tea brewing advice in the community. I've been um, requesting this for a long time and it doesn't seem to pop up. Um, but over time, more and more people are becoming qualified to do this type of analysis and we will start to see the paradigms change. I think that's about it. Um, I would conclude this portion of part one. We have um, part two planned for sometime in the next week, I would believe. And I've planned with Peter offline for about five to six uh, series over the coming weeks. And so, um, you know, check back, stay tuned and, um, you know, we'll get some more present presentations coming. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so there was a question a while. I, I just, I didn't know when you were going to end, so I didn't know when yeah. to say like, no worries. Heck in your questions, but uh, uh, Matt Steelbird asked, "What does Scott think about trichoderma?" Yeah, I just see that one. So trichoderma has been an interesting one. Um, when I went through the Soul Food Web courses, trichoderma was starting to pop up, and at that time, we had some undesirable aspects showing up. Um, a girl named Molly Haviland was a Soul Food Web consultant that was a little bit ahead of Sarah and I in timeline. And she actually had a microscope photo of trichoderma going inside of a saprophytic fungi. And so these, these organisms were starting to pop up on the agricultural scene in, um, I don't know, 2013, something like that. And so in the beginning, we were concerned that there was an issue with the trichoderma. And when you track a facility, Dr. Lane would say, the more trichoderma a farm uses, the lower the biological organisms we see. And um, I've what I've now learned after years of working with commercial clients is farms will never admit what they're using completely for IPM. And so what they would admit to is using trichoderma. And so we were taking data points from the space under the assumption that the only IPM was trichoderma. And we are also seeing significant compromises to aerobic organisms. So we have to make certain associations because no farm is going to tell you everything. And so you're constantly trying to discern between the information that you have, what you've been giving and what you know before you get to this point over what's happening. What we ended up finding out was those farms were spraying a lot of neem oil and neem oil is the most antimicrobial thing that living soil people use. And so we were uh, misappropriating the damage to the soil organisms to trichoderma and actually was the chosen IPM products. So I've personally changed my stance on trichoderma. I used to think that they were a bad thing. Now I just think it's pretty marginal. And um, what ends up happening is if you're in a trichoderma strategy, you are trying to solve powdery mildew by sending an, a parasite in the situation. And as far as strategies, I think this is the lowest level of effectiveness, even though you can have effectiveness with trichoderma. If you simply lower the omicete value, you don't need trichoderma. So, um, let's see. All right, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can see the chat too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there's one about lawn care. Everything's the same. That, that's what's crazy. I'll talk about that for a little bit while you're looking for another question. But my wife and I have worked with literally everything. Uh, um, you know, we've consulted for famous botanical gardens. We've consulted for city parks, um, palm trees. What have we done? We've done damn near everything. Um, we've worked with agricultural spaces as large as 6,000 acres. Everything... 
um, everything is the same, really. And so the concept is that it matches with every space is how do I inoculate with biologically complete compost? And how do I manage that space to maintain the proliferation of those organisms? Yeah, I was looking for that lawn mm -hmm. care. Uh, th there was, um, well, here's one. What should I test my soil for specifically? Can my local university extend? So what's the role of un university extensions? <laughs> for biological considerations, they're pretty worthless. Um, by far, and that sounds crazy to say, and people get offended when I say shit like that, but by far the most effective analysis tool for soil systems that I've found is the microscope analysis. I'm not saying I disregard chemistry. I do soil chemistry. I do Malik 3. I do saturated paste. What I'm saying is by far the most powerful analytical tool of the agricultural space involving soil is the microscope analysis defined by Dr. Lane Ingham. Um, you know, when I went through these courses in 2014, you had to find her at a workshop. I couldn't even afford the two day workshop. I only could afford the first day at that time. And, you know, in 2015, you were able to get um, an online course by itself. So for $800, you were able to take the microscope course. And unfortunately, the one negative consequence of the Soil Food Web School evolving into more of a trade school is you have to take the entire $5,000 package to get that microscope. And I, I think that's really unfortunate, honestly. And I've, I've voiced my complaints to the Soul Food Web School and they don't particularly care for my concerns. But the reality is I'm on your show right now. And whether you like me or not, the work that my wife and I have done is forever changed organic cannabis. We've changed the containers. We've changed the process. We've changed the outcome. And that has almost 100% come from our ability to analyze soil organisms and track them across the space. And when I went through and took these courses, I had to budget my meals for a month and a half to be able to afford a single day microscope course. And so I'm a person that has literally changed the planet, whether you like me or not, I've changed the planet and I've changed the way people grow cannabis that will never go back. And I was able to do that because I could afford a $250 day to meet Dr. Elaine. And now if it was 2021 and I'm that same person, I would not be able to afford that $5,000 course under that context. And I, I think that's, you know, my, I don't want to say too many negative things about the school, but I think that's absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that Dr. Lane, who started out as the grassroots hero is now unattainable from people like me that actually changed the planet. And I think that shit needs to change now because jump on YouTube right now, open up another window and type drought California. Look how many lakes in California are at a terrifyingly low point. Utah, California, um, every dam, dam is out of freaking water. And when I first met Dr. Lane in 2013, she made the bold statement that in 20 years, we might be out of fresh water to farm. And I used to say these types of things online and people would criticize me. They'd say I had a fear monger. I don't know, man. Why don't you check in with YouTube over the last month of the shit that's going on about water? And I just I think it's a matter of national security and a matter of human survivability that people know how to do this um, analysis. And that's what I believed when I first met Dr. Lane. You know, she said that she said this is a matter of national security. And when I was at that workshop, I said, this is a way that I can affect the planet. This is the way that I can contribute positively to climate change. And we've worked with that. We've done forest restoration. I've quantified the forest in California and it is terrifying. And I, I would just I mean, at this point, I'm demanding that the Soul Food Web School opens up a microscope quantitative analysis for people that can't afford the whole course. And I just, you know, I, I, I have integrity. And so it's not my microscope methods. I can't teach it. I refuse to teach it because I want people to support Dr. Lane. I still support Dr. Lane. Sarah is going through the newest classes right now. Like since 2013, we have taken every single course that Elaine has offered and we've paid for it. And I think other people should support that cause as well. But 
right now, you know, I don't want to get too much into coronavirus talk, but I feel that coronavirus is absolutely a human expression of colony collapse disorder that is stemming from a compromise to the biological communities of the planet and humans. And one of the ways that we can correct that is by empowering people to quantify these things and to execute this in the agricultural space. Do, do, does she have like a team of handlers around her that are kind of making these business decisions in your opinion or? Yeah, so based on my experience with Dr. Lane is she wants to be the scientist and I admire her for that. She doesn't get involved in any of the business discussions per se. So when she used to work with Environment Celebration, James and Carol would handle everything that had to do with business and Elaine would be the scientific person behind it. And so I think it's great what Luke and the Soul Food Web School has done as far as continuing to elevate Dr. Lane on her platform that she deserves. They've continued to um, they've continued to allow her to reach a broader scale and and qualify it more. When I went through it was grassroots and people didn't really recognize the certified. They didn't know what the hell it was. And now we're moving up into a formal trade school that's a, giving a university level experience. I think that's absolutely amazing. I think it's a major disservice to the planet and what Dr. Elaine has stood for since day one by not allowing people to take that microscope course. And people ask me to do it all the time, but I, I refuse to. I'm not teaching her work. Like I don't want people to teach my intellectual property. So I, I afford her the same respect. And so I feel like I'm kind of bound to um, you know this problem. And I just, I really don't know what to do about it, but it does keep me up at night, you know? So, and so there, um, mm -hmm. there's a question on uh, opinion on sprouted seed teas. <laughs> That's a funny logo. Is that a thumbs it, up? It, it's a thumbs up uh, <laughs> strawberry. That's hilarious. Go that way. But um, so sprouted seed teas, you know, that comes from the Clackamas Coot camp. And it's undeniable that they're effective on plant growth. Uh, what I've found in my work is that the application rates are absolutely out of context. And so it was very common in my early work when those were really popular that people would make up a five gallon batch for a single four by eight bed. What ends up happening when you do this is you stimulate the organism so much from providing a food source and enzymes and sugars and carbohydrates and everything else that's in that seed. You actually cause the system to collapse from overstimulation. We call this the boom bust. And what I focused on was what is an appropriate application rate of these sprouted seed teas. And so it was very common through 2015, 2016, 2017 to see a lot of people fighting russet mites. One of the common things in those russet mite issues was putting a whole five gallon bucket to a four by eight bed or something like that. And it's just an egregious application of that technique. If you want to use a sprouted seed tea, I would say the by far the most problematic compound or excuse me, the most problematic seed is alfalfa because the triacantinol, it's really common for people to overapply the growth hormone. If you have nutrition and growth hormones out of whack, you end up with gaps in the cells. And so it's like putting nitrous in your car. If you don't improve the strength of that head of that motor and you add nitrous, you're going to blow the thing right off. And so that's exactly what happens with triacantinol. So if you're going to Im introduce triacantinol, which is a growth hormone that leads to elongation of cells, you damn better sure fill those gaps with nutrition. Most of the people are also taking a water only approach, which is not going to fill that gap. So I think the alfalfa seed tea is by far the most problematic. If you're wanting to introduce triacantinol, you should just get a bottled product with triacantinol and do a very measured approach of it. Um, and then I think by far the most safe is barley or corn. And then the appropriate application rates that I've found that do not absolutely devastate soil communities would be something like a half a cup of the solution to a 65 gallon pot. So whatever that translates to per cubic foot. Um, that's what we used to do. So 20, uh, I don't know, 2016, 2017 ish, when we were still doing sprouted seed teas, we would do like a half a cup to a 65 gallon pot. So indoors on a 30 gallon, we'd do more like a quarter cup or less. That is an appropriate amount of those um, compounds and it will provide the benefit without causing catastrophic crop loss. And so what people don't understand that they're doing with those teas is so if you over apply an alfalfa seed tea, 
what you see is the tremendous growth response from the addition of growth hormones. So your mind says this was a good thing. What you don't see is that you've decimated organism populations. So you increase the demand on growth while stopping the nutrient producing potential of the soil, which is, you know, catastrophic. So um, if, if, you're, if you're going to do the sprouted CTs, keep it to an extremely conservative rate. I'd say hold off on the alfalfa or, I mean, do tablespoon type shit of that one if you're going to do it at all. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of problems with agriculture that living soil doesn't understand that you see in the, in the K&F as well is alfalfa is GMO Roundup ready. Like that shit is sprayed with a lot of glyphosate and then you're taking the seed from it and watering it to your garden. You know, same with corn, same with barley. Dude, people have no clue. Um, we do a lot of analysis of this type of stuff for the commercial space because you can't, you can't bring a product into a commercial facility that caused a test fail. So you need to know what compounds are in that product. And so if we're going to do a sprouted CT, you send it out for analysis. And, um, you know, I don't know. So, so, so here's a question uh, on kind of taking anaerobic activity and then introducing air and. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, that, that actually doesn't happen. Um, I'm not sure where that narrative got created or, or if somebody's putting that into the space, but no, that does, that doesn't actually happen. The best way I can pick, the best way I can make a visual, um, example of this is like picture a checkerboard. So when you start out a checkerboard on one side, there's black chips and on the other side, there's red chips and there's an equal amount. And if every morning you come in and add a row of red chips, at some point you're going to push those black chips off the road and it's going to be all red chips. That's what happens with anaerobic. It's what are you introducing? What you're introducing to the system is what dictates the conditions in the soil. The conditions in the soil dictate what organisms function. So as soon as you start to introduce anaerobic ferments to the soil system, you are completely changing that soil to anaerobic conditions. Organisms are very specialized. You, you, can't, you can't introduce a bunch of anaerobic organisms turn that landscape into anaerobic and expect a specialized organism that doesn't operate under those conditions to just magically flourish. You know, so. Uh, there was a uh, thoughts on SST. So that's the same uh, thing. Sprouted tea. Yeah, that's what I just landed on. That's yeah. What, that's uh, my thought. Talked about. Keep, keep uh, it to a half a cup per 65 gallons or less. Stay away from alfalfa, use corn and barley. So a local grass expert mentioned stimulating grass growth using, how do you pronounce glibberin? Glibberin? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's gibberellic. Uh, I gibberellic think, acid. Yeah, I think what I'm, so this uh, is. Gibberellic acid, right, right. Yeah, this, this is where I'm, I'm just not your guy. I, I had to fill a role of functionality in the space. And so my role in the industry was take people from where they're at in a commercial setting, whether that's a four light or 4,000 acres and turn that into functional soil food web. So in order to get to functional execution of the techniques, you have to start with things that are very controlled and quantifiable. So we don't do any ferments or any processes. The only process that we do is composting. Everything else we do is very calculated because we have to move people from where they're at to where they have to be. And for that to exist, we have to start with certain foundational principles that work in all areas of agriculture. And so we, we haven't personally ventured into, um, you know, dealing with fermented products. Again, this is where I also, I always defer to Dr. Lane. And I believe that anytime you ferment, you're increasing problems. So even when we're making compost, we're actually avoiding fermentation. You know, there's there's other people working on anaerobic techniques. I'm I'm not one of them for sure, and will never be. Based on what I've seen, I don't mess with any of that shit. Um, I know that upsets a lot of people, but the people that get upset by those statements haven't done any quantification. We've done literally thousands of microscope analysis. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's hard I to. 
it's hard to sift through the questions with all this nonsense and arguing back and forth. <laughs> your way to, your Scott, way to, it, as yeah. I like to tell people, if you ever want to feel bad about yourself, uh, yeah. come on and try to present something and yeah. just read the chat. And, oh, uh, I don't know. Even amongst and, themselves, they're just like arguing amongst but, themselves. But here, here, here is some positivity uh, from yeah. someone I respect. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, man. Like, I can't express enough that. You know, I came up through the farm crisis. I saw people go out of business. I had farmers come into my uncle's office and thank him for keeping them in business because he was so good at moving their product. And I had a lot of intimate conversations with farmers that lost a lot of money changing what they did. And so I've, um, yeah, thank you. And, you know, I, I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten those conversations with farmers that had things go right and wrong as I move into my professional consulting. And I'm not here to say that everything I've done is perfect. Um, you know, we've made some mistakes along the way. In the first couple of years, we were extremely effective because we were only analyzing and adjusting. I really only started getting into problems when we started tackling soil making. Um, probably the biggest financial problems I've caused for a farm were in the soil making process, which is just extremely difficult. Um, and there's just a lot of things that could go wrong. But I take a lot of pride in the fact that we have in a remarkable return on investment of the work that we provide, which is actually episode six or five or six. Um, I'm going to go over the economics of Soul Food Web. So I'm going to actually show what the effects of changing these things are from a numeric standpoint, um, which I have to be really careful because the farms that we work with literally ask us to not talk about this stuff. So I have to find a balance between contributing positively to the planet and helping everybody move along without upsetting or making the people that literally pay my bills feel vulnerable. So my first consideration is the people that we work with on the client consultant relationship, but a very large portion of our mind is to what are we doing to the overall planet? How are we affecting the community in general? And, um, you know, that. The this is actually an interesting one because it's something I think about. Like, what I, I, I've always been confused. Like, is EM1 just a proprietary blend of readily available, or not readily available, but microbes? Like, like why, why couldn't I just figure out what the ratios of microbes are in what's called EM1 and make my own version? Or is that like, I, I like to call EM1 a gateway drug. EM1. EM1. In a good way or a bad way? Yeah. No, in, in a good way. In a good way. It, it, it's the gateway to soil food web concepts. It was the first thing that I was introduced to that was biological. I believe hygrozyme might even be an EM1 type enzyme, something or other. And um, so EM1 is good for aquaponics. Again, I did a lot of aquaponics work from 2010 to 2014. EM1 is extremely effective in those systems. I think the popularity of EM1 really helps show the misunderstanding of these biological systems by the widespread agricultural community. So if you look at EM1, EM1 is one simple bacteria. You're talking about one type of bacteria or one single species of bacteria. And not only that, they're a facultative anaerobe. So really all they do is digest organic material. They don't, from what I understand, they don't produce compounds or benefit that are to higher level plants. And so, you know, there's a comment right now talking about Elaine trashing EM1. She's not, I wouldn't say she trashes EM1. It's just a frustration that people, yeah. And it's not trashing. It's, and I, I will before I say this, I got to give Dr. Lane a lot of credit for always maintaining very positive. She just recently did another presentation with John Kemp and she's as polite and lovely as possible. If you go back through my media history, you can definitely tell the times when I was really sour and I was really pissed off at the growing community at wide. And I have a really hard time not letting that come through in my media presentations. And um, Dr. Lane doesn't do that. And so if you would define if you would define something as her trashing it, that probably means she's had 20 years of frustration of having to talk about some shit and she wants the industry to evolve. And so if you're catching frustration, 
man, she probably has a decade of quantifying that is not that great for you. <laughs> so when you talk about like people like to compare EM1 to biologically complete compost. And so, you know, during the, uh, what do they call it? The DNA project or what they call that thing? Um, the microbiome project. What'd they call that? The genome. The, yeah. The, 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 the uh, Kevin McKernan. There's just, there was like a scientific community wide study of the genomes from the late nineties into the early two thousands. Nonetheless, I guess that's when they started sequencing the DNA of bacteria. And if I could remember from Elaine's courses, the soil food web courses, I think there's something like a hundred thousand species of bacteria that are estimated to be found in a healthy, productive forest system. So if you talk about comparing EM1, which is one species or one type of bacteria, and you try to compare that to 100,000 species, you know, it's like the difference in, in crayons as a kid. You get one gray crayon versus somebody that has the 64 box. Like, what can you draw with one gray crayon? What can you draw with an entire box of color pencils? And I don't know, I guess that's just like the best way I can try to compare it. And, and so if you, you start to understand the functions of these organisms and what they do, the EM1 just really digests gunk. And the reason why EM1 is so popular is because of the capitalistic commercial aspects of agriculture. So the things that you're most familiar with are the things that are being paid the most to put in front of you. And EM1 is one of those things. I don't think it's bad. I just think if you're relying on EM1 and you like living soil, you should try real compost. You're you literally 30 to 40% increase in all categories if you move away from EM1, you know? So all right, we have some uh, anaerobic. Yeah, good old potent ponics. He's got to jump up in my presentation and be salty. Get that shit off here. <laughs> Seriously, get it off here. That dude's salty. Um, I don't even know what to say about him. Uh, he's a sweet guy, I guess, but salty. There, so. there was a question. Uh, if I can, oh, so uh, would dichondra would that lead your list? Yeah, I guess I should be so dismissive to potent ponics. So what he's saying is, I don't know why the Elaine camp can't get around anaerobic mineralization. It's part of the food web. This is going to sound arrogant as fuck when I say this, but you're 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 talking about a group of people that gather regularly, people that graduate Soul Food Web School that take this seriously. Nick Tomasini, Catalyst Bio Amendments, Ian from Cure Soil, um, Eli Baraja, Bahia. I apologize. I can never say his last name. Um, my wife and I, we meet regularly and catch up to make sure that we're accurate. Um, Catalyst Bio Amendments is right down the street from me. They sell biologically complete compost. From all definitions, they are the closest person to competing with my business as a biologically complete compost manufacturer. We still share and exchange compost. We still share and exchange numbers because even though we're competing business, the team that we're on is accuracy and integrity. And when catalysts fire up their compost, I share some of my compost with them. They share some of their compost with me for diversity. Same with Nick Tomasini, same with Ian, same, same with Eli. And then we'll look at samples together. So we'll count a sample to make sure that we're seeing the same thing. So when you talk about the average growing community who doesn't own a microscope, has never been qualified to do the quantification of soil organisms, and they come up with narratives. And then they try to compare those narratives to a group of people that are literally meeting regularly to make sure that we're saying the same things, that we're seeing the same things, and that 300 micrograms of fungi is 300 micrograms of fungi over here. And so those are the two camps that are comparing narratives. Potent Ponics, to my understanding, I don't know that he's ever quantified specifically with the microscope, the things that he says. And so if he thinks anaerobic mineralization is part of the food, food web and beneficial, literally my entire body of work disagrees with that profoundly, like remarkably profoundly disagrees with that. And people get really upset. And I hope this doesn't translate poorly to the media to get, you know, 
locked in YouTube. But to me, it's fucking absurd that a group of people that have never done one single quantification try to argue with the people that are literally the only quantification and try to say that those narratives are equal and they're, and they're just not. And I have not seen one single example where the soil was harvesting anaerobic organisms, harvesting anaerobic processes that came anywhere near the results that I get, Nick Tomasini gets, Eli gets, doesn't even come close. And we have zero powdery mildew, like zero powdery mildew. The first thing and the easiest thing to correct in living soil is powdery mildew. All you gotta do is correct the ratio between anaerobic organisms and aerobic organisms. You reduce the omycetes, you increase the aerobic fungi. Without making any other change, powdery mildew leaves and never comes back. When we started working in the regulated space in Nevada, we worked with several cultivators in that state because it was extremely difficult to navigate what they called the total aerobic count or the organism quantities. As the omycete value increased in the soil, the test fail incidence went up. So my entire income in uh, 2016 and 2017 was paid for by working with cultivators in Nevada that were trying to navigate this aerobic anaerobic parameter. What we found was as we reduced omycetes, test fails completely stopped. We didn't even get to the addressing of any other aspects that we thought it was coming from. Literally changing one aspect in the soil removed um, uh, powdery mildew completely. Most farms that work with us on, an, on a person-to-person -person consulting full relationship, within the first harvest, we can get the powdery mildew out of the building. There's a couple farms each year that it persists into the second harvest. Usually that's from the learning curve of using the blue mat system. So a flood will co cause a powdery mildew incidence, or it persists into the second harvest because there's something that they're having a hard time letting go of for trusting the new way. But most farms that trust us, powdery mildew leaves within the first harvest and it never comes back, never. And I don't know, man. I just, I don't, you know, I'm not allowed to, sh or I'm not going to share all the intense data we have from our client consultant relationships because that's an agreement I make to our clients. But at some point, you just got to take my word. And I just, I don't, you know, I don't understand. I don't understand why uh, those narratives are equal because they're not. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, some love from Hawaii. Aww, yeah, no, I, 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 I see uh, Steve, Steve's emailed me and I got your email, but I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's like someone gives a presentation like, let's yeah. just politely listen and, uh, yeah. you know, take, take what, uh, what you want from it. If you want to, yeah. you know, I, I do like, you know, constructive, critical debate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to, you know, but yeah. as someone mentioned, this is getting Jerry Springer-ish. And I'm like, yeah, that's not e e <laughs> what I joked one time yeah. that I'm going in that direction. I didn't mean to that one time imply that I enjoy going in the Jerry Springer direction. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's not Jerry Springer. It's passion. We are passionate ass people. And, you know, we love not we all of us like, all, you know, cannabis farmers are extremely passionate people. And as an educator, you're even more passionate about the things you teach. And what, what the general public doesn't understand is that when I present my information, it makes other people's information wrong and they get really defensive of this. And I just, you know, I don't say a lot of things publicly. There's a lot of stuff that I had in this original presentation in 2017 that I did not include in here. Um, because even in 2017, when I spoke to 125 people, the week after the workshop was literally completely consumed with garden centers, tea brewery manufacturers, um, online retailers of things, calling and yelling and demanding that they speak to me about what I said. And, you know, the unfortunate reality about the world we're in is the world's changing. The understanding of the world is changing. The education of the farmer is changing. The Soil Food Web School is putting out other technicians, just like my wife and I, that are empowering farmers to make better decisions. And this is changing the narrative of what's good and what's bad. 
And unfortunately, there's some influencers in the industry that are resistant to that change. And I can just tell you that isn't going to age well, you know. And so you either figure out how to get on board with the changing understanding of soil food web systems or you don't. And um, the people are going without you. That's, you know, we're moving out of the guru era and moving into the empowered farmer era. And if you want to continue to be a guru, you're going to get left behind by a farmer that is more intelligent and more equipped than the current internet gurus. And that's just the fact of life. So, and not everybody has to do what I do. That's the beauty of the world. You can do whatever potent Ponix wants to say. You can follow whoever's advice you want to follow. That's your prerogative. And you know, that's the beauty of free will. You can do whatever the hell you want. I choose to not have any powdery mildew in any facility we work with. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. So. I'm currently battling. Uh, I told you I'm battling powdery mildew with my mm. uh, with my yeah. shard right now. Yeah. Uh, well, so all right. St the, the, I, I don't think this is totally accurate. Steve mm. says, seriously, if you're going to call me by name, let me defend myself and show my lab results. But you've been heckling him the whole time. <laughs> so he's responding to the heckling. Um, I don't know. Cause and effect, my man. I don't really know what to do about potent ponics. I uh, offended him back in Oregon and he hasn't gotten over it. Um, but I don't know, man. I don't know what to say. Like the education of the farmer is exceeding the influencers on the Internet and the influencers need to either up their game or get left behind. And I just I'm not going to throttle myself because the egos of other people are threatened by accountability. And if you're threatened by accountability, that's between you and your God, not me. So. And I think in kind of the spirit of uh, Lincoln Douglas debates, it's like let one person <laughs> get their uninterrupted thoughts out and then let another person who has heard yeah. those thoughts at a separate time uh, not to kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think, to, you know. You, sh you should give him his own show and let him present his case. But no, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll bring him on, yeah. let him do his presentation, and yeah. and and in long. F for me, it, 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 it's long form. It's it's not constantly interrupting someone. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. My biggest frustration is so many people agree on like ninety five percent of things, and those are the people who like hate similar people the most mm -hmm. uh versus if like i brought on like a scott's miracle grow mm -hmm. <laughs> like scientist to come present there'd be less like i i don't know it, it, it's just weird it's like it, all of us care about the same stuff like everybody watching cares about the environment um every you know you and steve probably agree on 90 percent of things you and could probably agree on, agree on 10 percent <laughs> what's that i say we agree on like 10 percent okay but yeah. but uh how, you, you and coot probably agree on a bunch of stuff uh none, it, less. It, none less. zero okay less than 10 <laughs> but but there's some stuff you agree on the intentions are so, the same we all think um, we're helping we all think we're helping yeah and that's like i said that's the beauty of your show you you just bring people on and let them speak their their case and you know, I have a tremendous amount of gratitude for you. You've seen my work. You know exactly what I'm capable of doing. And you saw that back in 2017. Like, Fact. That, was a, yes. that was a long ass time ago. And that's why you give me this well, platform. And, and I also you know? know just how much yeah. Yeah. Hate, hate you've gotten along the way. <laughs> I don't know how much. Yeah, you could call it that. It's, it's because we're effective. And, you know, effect, effective, just to give us some parameter, right? So we worked with a 6,000 acre farm that was growing corn and soy in 2016. The literal, the same month we were consulting for an organization that was managing 26 cannabis properties of a million square feet. And at the same month we were working at literally the largest farm trying to do living soil at scale for agriculture and literally the largest organization in cannabis trying to do living soil at scale. On the corn and soy farmer, um, it probably cost, I think it was like $35,000 in equipment, infrastructure, um, buildings, 
uh, our education, the materials needed to execute living soil, and the time that we spent out there for three weeks. That first year of adding compost to that system, you can reduce fertilizer inputs by a half. In 2016, when we worked that farm, it cost $200 per acre to fertilize corn. And so that's $1.2 million in fertilizer for that crop season that we just cut in half. So on one farm, by adding biology, we cut the need for fertilizers by $600,000. If you don't think that's gonna get the attention of people, you have not been paying attention to the world you live in. Um, at the same time, when we were working in organic cannabis, we were hired by a farm that, or an organization of farms that was having trouble getting the yields that they wanted in the commercial space. And they had an additive that they had to add during flowering to get flower fill. In, a, in one building that was 65,000 square feet, that cost $200 a day in flowering additions to every space that was in flowering. And so you can translate to a per square foot number and you can translate to a million square feet. I think it translates to something like $2,000 a day of cost that that organization was having in buying additional fertilizers to get the flower fill and living soil. All Sarah and I did was take nematodes that we extracted from compost, introduce them into a test facility, and we were able to completely eliminate that bloom booster. So you're talking about tremendous economic changes to the agricultural landscape. And anytime you take money out of one person's pocket and put it into the farmer's pocket, that is going to produce hate. And that is gonna produce a resistance to the people that are sharing that message. My wife and I share that message. My wife and I receive that hate because of the change we're making to agriculture. The economic shift that we've put into the cannabis space is literally unmanageable. I don't even know how to calculate the effect. Uh, we worked for a facility that was 10,000 square feet that we were able to see very specific income information. And after a year of working with us, we changed their profit model so much that on 10,000 square feet, it led to another million dollars in profit. Um, and reduced powdery mildew completely. So that farm increased their profit by a million dollars a year, and they're spending zero dollars on powdery mildew prevention. You know, if you're listening to this, look at your budget. You should you should do your you should do a budget. You should know what you spend on, spend on pest control products. As we move further and further away from things like Eagle Twenty and Avid, we're buying things like Trifecta and Plant Therapy and literally spending thousands of dollars on these products. And so if we take that money out of the farm or out of the hands of pest control people and out of chemical people, and we put it into the hands of farmer, that's going to get some manufactured hate. And this was something that I was kind of, uh, you know, primed on by Dr. Elaine. Once I got to the point where we were sitting one-on-one -on -one and having dinner, she really let me know the details of what happens. And if you look at, the time that Sarah and I came in, um, in 2013, 2014, 2015, in 2015, when we were invited to the advisors meeting, there was 12 people. There was literally 12 people at that meeting. And I looked around, I was like, damn, there's only 12 people to do this. And when I got to talk to Dr. Lane, I got to see the intimacy of what happens. And the reality is, is as you start to become soul food web qualified, and you start to enter the market and make radical changes, you start to receive a tremendous amount of pushback from chemical companies and gurus in the industry. And most people can't hack that. Um, and so most people would get into the space, find out it was extremely difficult to actually become a viable consultant. It was hard to get people to con convince you to pay you money to show them something that they're unfamiliar with. And on top of that, you're getting fucked with by people like Monsanto. And so people didn't, pass through that ceiling. And so that's why Dr. Elaine really took us under our wing because both Sarah and I are remarkably suited to piercing through that, that glass ceiling. You know, I grew up in Southern California where there was a big crab mentality where people were constantly talking shit about you. So I've always been different. People have always talked shit about me. I don't really care that people like potent ponics don't like me. It does not affect my day to day. And so my personality allows me to be true to myself. It allows me to bring accountability into the space and it allows me to deal with the backlash that is presented by my work on the community. And I just could give a shit, you know? 
Um, the results that I see speak for themselves. The one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have as farmers speak, speak for themselves. And people can hate all they want. It, it does not affect my day at all, you know, at all. And, you know, because Sarah and I were able to blast through that resistance, you know, that pressure from the Monsantos and the chemical companies and the internet gurus is allowing other people to follow through. And so if you're going to be the tip of the spear, you're going to break the most flesh. And, you know, that was an agreement that I made that I was willing to go through the hardship that nobody else prior to me was willing to go through so that other people maybe didn't have to do it. And I saw that somebody needed to take the brunt of that. And, you know, you saw that happen in 2017 when I commented about neem cake. And literally every single year, an influencer with 10,000 or more followers spends a week or two trashing my name. And is that because I'm a bad person? No, it's because I'm effective and I bring accountability to the agricultural space. And if a chemical company can pay an Instagram influencer to trash my name, that puts doubt in your mind as a viewer if I'm worth listening to. And unfortunately, that has a tremendous effect on most people. It doesn't affect me and it doesn't affect the clients that call us directly. And in fact, I thank these people, you know, like I thank the Clackamas Coots and the people that have tried to destroy my name online because every time it happens, my business literally doubles. Like in 2017, when I made that meme post, we had already seen a year and a half of complete fuckery with Neem Cake. And that's why I finally just made an Instagram post. And literally overnight, my business doubled and I started getting calls from people and they said, you know, I started following this advice and I had these negative results that you spoke about. Do you have the solution? And so in this really weird, twisted way, by pushing through without fear of being attacked, it actually connected with me with the people that want my services. And so the people that go out of their way to trash my name on Instagram, they actually build my business because it connects me with people that are frustrated with those types of influencer comments and advice that just flat out doesn't work, you know? So it continues to reinforce that I shouldn't have any emotions about people feeling um, negative about me as a person because my business continues to grow. So... Would you agree with this statement? People think confidence in statistical analysis is arrogance when arrogance comes from ignorance. I don't even really know what that means, if that's good or bad. <laughs> no, I, I don't know good. if that's good or bad. I think it's good. But I'm able to come up here and confidently say and speak my truth because I've measured it. I know that my numbers are accurate because I calibrate myself with Nick Tomasini. I calibrate myself with my wife. I calibrate myself with catalyst bio amendments. I, cal I, I, um, I calibrate myself with Eli. I know that my numbers are correct. And so as long as my data has integrity, as long as I don't shift those numbers, as long as I maintain with accuracy, there shouldn't be any fear to speak what I speak, you know? So there you go. Got it. There were... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. But in, but in short, you're not going to get all these egos in cannabis to ever agree. And no one's ever going to 100 percent like each other. And that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to usher in a new paradigm of the empowered farmer. And the arguing from egos does not empower farmers. Educating farmers empowers farmers. I agree. So. All right. Well, here. For episode two through six. <laughs> yeah, with that, uh... you know, so, but again, man, I can't thank you enough, Peter. You're the only person that gives me a voice. I had to make my own podcast to give myself a voice. I don't get invited on podcasts because I don't shout out compost brands and I don't play the game and people know that I'm going to speak my truth and I'm not going to hold back. So they don't allow me to speak their, my truth on their channel. And I just have intense gratitude for for you allowing me to connect with literally tens of thousands of people. You know, I, I might put a video on my YouTube page and get 256 views. I come and talk with you and I might reach 85,000 people. I just there's nothing that I can do in my own capacity that can match that. And so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude for you for allowing me to speak my piece on your show. 
and I appreciate the friendships that we've had since 2017. And, you know, I, I appreciate greatly that you let people speak their piece. If you go through and listen through all the videos, there is a remarkable contradiction in what people say if you listen to all the videos. And I think that's the beautiful aspect of your show is that you just let people and then people align with who they need to align. The people that and, don't like and, me. And don't specifically, me. <laughs> I, I, Steve, it, it's, mm -hmm. and I'm addressing Put and Ponix. I will mm -hmm. give you an hour to to make yeah. your points on anaerobic mineralization, wh whatever mm -hmm. you want to make a point on that you disagree with. But I'd like to give people yeah. uninterrupted time to, you, yeah. you know, it's like I think everybody like like nobody ever watches a presidential debate with 10 people on stage where every candidate gets like their one mm -hmm. minute zinger sound bites yeah. and says that was really like substantive. And mm -hmm. for me, that's what I'm trying to create is the, I, I I'm trying to go more in the Lincoln Douglas debate direction. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I like when people not like likes probably the wrong word but like it, if someone sees someone else who comes on and presents a well thought out like like here's here's how i got to the point i'm at with my thinking mm -hmm. and someone else then says mm, i i don't think that thinking's correct like come on in a nice way and say yeah. i i disagree and here's my logical, well thought out rationale for why I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the first person can come back and say, wow, like I hear, you know, you, you made some great points and they and they forced me to reassess, uh, you know, some some mm -hmm. of my assumptions or some of that. Uh, Steve, I'll bring you on like you mm -hmm. can show it for an hour yeah. straight uh yeah so yeah. I, I i'm not censoring you i'm saying if, if tomorrow you want to come on and present whatever you want to present but like this is it, it it's like walking into a conference or a seminar room with someone speaking and starting to heckle the speaker and being like i want to be heard it's like mm -hmm. your your panel is <laughs> is tomorrow afternoon i don't know like well uh, and that and that, well, that's the good thing about your show, right? Somebody can jump on and maybe get the opportunity to go on. You sure as hell ain't getting invited on the Shingalos podcast by chiming in the comments, you know? Uh, you sure as hell not getting involved on the Kiss Organics podcast by chiming in the comments. And you do do that. And I and, and Steve and I can disagree, but the beauty of your show is it allows him the opportunity to possibly come on your show. And you put people's... Uh, name up there i think that's a really cool thing you're giving a voice to more than just which was my which was my you know the original conversation we had in 2016 that was my objection the same six people are saying the same tired ass story and you know the the story is not evolving with science the story is not evolving with what we're seeing in our professional work and your platform allows the industry to actually evolve and evo evolution is gonna, there's gonna be some blood spurt, you know? There's gonna be some disagreeing, there's gonna be some conflict, but hey man, YouTube is the number two searched thing. You can type in and find whatever you want. And Steve, I disagree <laughs> that Scott brought your name into it. You had been heckling him and yeah, I don't. <laughs> previously to him bringing your name into it. So uh, Sorry, let, let's mind. not forget where it started and, and, and I'll give you yeah. the opportunity to speak, uh, mm. uninterrupted as well. Um, mm. you know, for me that there, there's no right way or wrong way to handle mm -hmm. when shit goes kind of sideways. Uh, so like for yeah. some people I'm handling it properly for other people, I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. You know what? So, There's 7 billion people. How many are you going to keep happy, Peter? I don't yes. try to keep any of them happy. I try to keep myself happy. I try to keep my wife happy. And I try to keep my clients happy. And most importantly, I, tr I have accountability to myself. I have accountability to my advice. I have accountability to the numbers. I have accountability to the information we share. And I can't ask that of anybody else, but they can come on your show and they can share whatever viewpoint they want. And that's the beauty of living in America. You can say whatever the hell you want on the internet until further notice. And so for now, <laughs> we're gonna, you know, speak our piece and 
You know, I definitely wouldn't be talking about Steve if he wouldn't be trying to make his name known. So I don't know. That's just what happens with these internet people. They put themselves in there and they get mad when you talk about them. So let him speak his piece. And the people that want to align with Steve can align with Steve. And the people that want to align with me can align with me. And, you know. For everybody else, you can... <laughs> take information you hear from uh, and this is kind of what i've always Mm -hmm. tried to do is allow information out there for people to then synthesize it in their own minds and their own Mm -hmm. operations like like you're i i think you a lot of what you deal with is commercial grows and when you know you see ideas being pushed out there um which may work in my backyard i don't think they work i would disagree i don't think they even work in the backyard (laughs) but 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 you're seeing a commercial operation apply ideas that they heard at scale and mess stuff up um well we and and then you kind of you 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 do like the forensic analysis of like well what were you doing and then they tell you what they were doing and um yeah. And, well, and anyway, my, my, my yeah. thing is is allowing people to, to get ideas out there, but then hoping that if other people disagree with those ideas to in in a I don't know, I, I, I feel like a lot of what we're seeing in social media is people acting not how they would act if they were sitting in a circle with other people. Right. And, and so like in a polite way, like respond with like like a high school paper here's my thesis here are my three supporting paragraphs here's my conclusion which kind of reiterates everything i've already said yeah Um, well so i i just to clarify we work with all scales we work with the small scale but my passion is in the largest scale because every day more and more commercial farms are being built out as living soil because the numbers do not lie. I don't really want to reveal all those numbers because the clients we work with don't want those numbers revealed, but more and more every day farms that were hydroponics are realizing that living soil is the most suited technique for the regulated cannabis space. And the numbers just do not lie. And so I feel that I make the greatest overall impact on the planet by affecting the largest landscapes, mostly because nobody else is really doing a great job. Um, There's other advice that works its way into commercial space, and it has varying degrees of success. Um, When it's not successful, it's certainly not talked about, and those narratives don't change. Um, I take tremendous pride that we have phenomenal results in the commercial space, and we make farms be very profitable. Um, at the same time, we work with the smallest growers because if I can take a tent grower like Aaron, who we had on our show, if I can teach him the same principles we teach our commercial clients and he executes the same level of quality in um, his small tent, um, he's never going to buy hydroponic cannabis from the dispensary again. Once he produces high quality living soil cannabis in his own house, they typically will never spend their money on salt grown cannabis ever again. And so the way that I make radical change to the landscape of the planet is by doing the best job I can at the largest scale to have the greatest volume impact from water usage, chemical usage, sustainability aspects. And then I drive the market for those products by helping the smallest grower. So We actually work very intimately with small growers. We have a private forum on our website where we work specifically with um, small growers. Um, And so I do work with both. The part that the world doesn't see is our analysis of popular trends. There's popular trends that have not worked since day one that nobody wants to talk about. And neem was one of those. I think neem cake has some beneficial aspects. I think neem, neem cake has some um, some benefits to be brought, but the way it was being used through 2016 was remarkably problematic. And we start to see that it takes about a year and a half to two years before a popular trend gets um, presented. It gets worked through the system and then it is determined as either good or bad. And my job is literally analyzing that and literally analyzing all the popular trends. 
So farmers think that they're really unique and independent, but re in reality, all living soil farmers are really kind of falling under like two or three main groups and techniques. They're doing the ferment anaerobic, they're doing the, you know, water only, um, or they're doing some, uh, some people don't even know, but there's a whole group that do soluble salts and calls it living soil. Um, and then there's more of like the high performance aspects of living soil. And so most cultivators fall under four basic strategies of aggregation of information. And our job working with farms is literally quantifying the success of all those outcomes. And the unfortunate reality is if I were to come out real time and speak the truth of what's happening, I'd be booed off stage everywhere I went because people can't tolerate accountability and reality. And it takes a year or two for certain things to shake out. And we just kind of sit back patiently waiting for those to happen because I'm not adverse to confrontation, but I'm not trying to create it. And so it's not my my desire to out anybody in the industry. But there's certain narratives that have been whacked since 2015. Um, there's a specific group that's been predominating a narrative that's remarkably incorrect from a biological standpoint since 2016. I've spoken to them personally at the Emerald Cup on three different occasions. We've had email exchanges back and forth, and that narrative still has not changed. And so it makes you wonder why do certain influencers from the internet maintain um, information that is literally causing farms to go out of business for four, five, six years. You know, they know my work is real. I've talked to them in person. I've spoken to the issues with their advice and they don't change it. And farmers go out of business. And when those farmers reach going out of business, they call my wife and I. And so my wife and I are trying to take farms from a point of extreme desperation um, at any given time, we probably have one farmer that I would say is on the suicide watch. Like they're on such despair, about to lose everything that I would put them on. I would say that they're on suicide watch. We're checking in with them to make sure that they're emotionally okay. And we're keeping up with them. That's what my job does. The heaviest of my, the heaviness of my job is sorting out all the bullshit and trying to take a farmer from where they're at and put them back into the profitable category put them back into successful after navigating all these internet ideas. And if I come right, if I made a presentation, Peter, of real time, what we're seeing, I mean, my car would get ran off the road. Like it just wouldn't go down. And um, that's just the reality of the world. And until the farmer demands more accountability of the people that gives them advice, nothing's going to change. And all that we can do is work one-on-one -on -one with farms to show what accountability means and to help them move into a position of profitability. And that's all I can do. And I can just come on your show and I can share my information, but I literally took things out of this presentation that I presented in person in 2017, just because I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to have people that make tea brewers calling me and cussing me out again. They haven't evolved since 1994. Like, come on, you know, get with it. Um, the soils that are produced for cannabis are absolutely atrocious. Um, but if I, reveal all that information, I'm, you know, it's just not worth it. So we do it one-on-one -on -one and we work with farms individually to navigate where they're at and using the foundational principles of analysis that we learned from Dr. Elaine, learning the accountability of data from Dr. Elaine, that is remarkably effective at navigating farms out of trouble. And like I said, I can't change the mind of everybody on the planet. I can only work one-on-one. -on -one. So but we got part two coming up. We got part three, four, and five. Maybe part and six. six. <laughs> we may have an Eric sighting. Yeah, Eric's definitely gonna come on. He's in the comments. I see him. We need to find out what his date. We're gonna. What? So this, Where? What's it, What's his YouTube? Is the his YouTube? greenhouse advisory group is in there somewhere? Oh, I didn't um, even see that. Yeah, but um, the original presentation with was with Eric and I. So when Eric and I can solidify a date. We'll do a facility layout conversation. So he'll give his greenhouse presentation and I'm going to give my facility layout presentation of what happens to biology in a greenhouse. Um, so when him and I can orchestrate the same days off, he's going to come down and he'll present for a couple hours. I'll present for a couple hours and then we'll do a Q&A together. All right. And for myself, for Scott, mm -hmm. for everybody in the chat, as soon as we conclude this, whoop. 
W- well, was that you're trying to? <laughs> you're gonna do the uh, side out. swipe. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Scott is like, uh, yeah. When, when you give someone a new tool to play with, like the uh, yeah. the uh, video mixer swipes. I'm. Uh, I'm what I was gonna say is, I I'm gonna look in the mirror <laughs> and tell myself I'm good enough. You I'm are smart enough, and doggone it, at least some people like me. I suggest everyone else do the same. Yeah. Hug someone you love. I'm gonna find my little kids and uh, yeah. and love them. And just remember, we're all mm-hmm. we're, we we all believe in a lot of the same things, such yeah. as the environment and uh, healthy food, and uh, that animals and plants deserve a place here too. And yeah, um, and time's crunching, man. Look at the drought. Yeah. Like, time's no, crunching. It, it's some scary shit. I mean, when, when you're talking about suicides, it makes me think of like all the mm-hmm. stories from India where, you know, it's like they get racked with debt. Uh, you know, just some, it, it's horrific. And, uh, and, and I think everybody in the chat uh, agrees mm-hmm. with that. Like, <laughs> we may not agree on some things, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know everyone's heart is in a in a good place, um, but with that we will figure out the ne- <laughs> the next. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, th- this this is a critical question. Um, Going back to the questions, what has Scott been puffing on? Uh, nothing lately. I'm trying to take two months off. Um, one of the weird consequences of working with the best cannabis growers in the planet is you get, you just smoke a shitload of weed and my lungs are actually starting to have problems. Um, and it's actually starting to cause stomach issues. A lot of cannabis farmers define that they have IBS or ulcerative colitis or some other stomach issue. And it's actually mast cells. So mast cells are in the sinuses and the throat down the lining into the stomach and they're in your lungs as well. And so now when I smoke, um, it causes intestinal issues and lung issues and sinus issues. So I'm actually taking a little bit of break. I'm going to try and take a month off, let my body heal, and then get back into it. Um, but right actually, now, right now, I'll tell you what I'm growing. So on the porch, I'm growing some uh, genetics from uh, from uh, James, who goes by Higher Thought Guru. I've got his, um, I've got two that are stir fry by uh, Cherry Limonade by Pina. So it's GMO by Orange Cookies by um, uh, Cherry Limonade by Pina. I've got two of those. I got one that he calls a dakini, and then I've got um, something that was uh, sourced by one of our good friends, um, Oscar, and he goes by Lifted Spirit uh, Collective, I believe is his IG. So he, I'm growing three from him that he's, so he's got a Kush mints by blueberry syrup that he hunted in a bag of seeds. I'm doing an artificial red that he hunted in a bag of seeds. And then I'm doing a beach wedding uh, that he hunted in a bag of seeds. And that's going to be my offering. I'm also growing, uh, I got some, uh, I got one hemp plant. It's uh, CBD Blessings F2 that I got from Bodhi. Um, I just popped two seeds. One didn't germ, one popped out female. So I have a male pollen from uh, MedTree seeds from an entourage effect, which I'm not sure the, uh, I forget what genetics are in there. I think it's like ACDC canatonic type thing. Um but I, I got some pollen from a nice male that a beautiful structure that I'm going to put to the CBD blessings, I'm trying to do a CD, uh, CBD seed increase and get those out to the people. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm growing. So when those come harvest, I'm going to smoke that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you'll be back. <laughs> yeah. So again, man, can't thank you enough for letting me go on the show and, uh, you know, rant and rave and, you know, get belligerent on live TV for the people to search forever in YouTube history. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the chat comments that go along with it. All right. Well, everyone, uh, <laughs> hug someone. Yeah. Love yourself. Love your yeah. family. Go put your feet in the dirt. Touch it. You know, coming from Southern California, you uh, can go literal Steve. weeks without ever touching the planet. Take your shoes Illinois. off. And touch the grass, man. Up here in Grass Valley, they call it grounding, some sort of hippie shit. But uh, I don't know, man. Peep game. Until next week, part two. (laughs) All right.
I, I, oh, so just quickly, so tomorrow uh, we have um, Steve Cantwell, who Scott knows. Mm -hmm. uh, Saturday we got Chad Westport and some home growers. Nice. Uh, we'll figure your round two out. Up, oh, he's back. <laughs> uh, Sunday we got James Loud and someone, but I'm totally yeah. blanking on. Uh, That's anywho. dope. Steve, Steve is one of the original pioneers to really kick ass in living soil, and I'm really happy to see that he's talking more. Um, he's been very quiet about what he does, which I don't blame him because it's a competitive, cold ass world out there, and people forget that dude was a world champion UFC fighter. And you're a world champ to become a world champion UFC fighter. You don't post your training regimen. You just bust it out and win a belt. So I think it's really dope that Steve's talking more and um, looking forward to seeing his contributions to your channel. Yes, that yeah. is Steve Cantwell. Can't, yeah. can't with a T yeah, in the middle. Yeah, it's a good dude. So anyway, yeah. all right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go see what's going on in the sunshine. and. Yeah. <laughs> Bring my two-year-old to the garden and pick pick some strawberries. There you and go. Alex Hardy, I, I sent you a picture of your uh, blue corn growing outside right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right on, guys. All right. Don't let your feelings get Scott, hurt. Scott, go, go give that <laughs> wife of yours a hug. Will do. All Check right. you later. See you, everyone.